The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. special board meeting to order and I would entertain the first motion Does somebody have it I move that the resignations of staff as listed be approved Second. Sandy carried six seven zero I move that the employment of staff as listed be approved Second. Sandy Carried 7 0. That concludes my agenda. All right. Um, I'd entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And we'll restart in four minutes. I'd like to call the board meeting to order. All seven board members are present this evening. We're also joined at the table to my left by Dr. Michelle Langenfeld, our superintendent. To my far left is Sandy Heller, our board secretary. And to my right is Jamie Barbian, who is from West High School and president of the Intercity Student Council. And um, it looks like we'll be joined later by Philip Balch from Preble. I'll just introduce him. He's um, going to be joining Jamie at the table. Um, first, we have time for open f a public forum is is there anyone who would like to speak to the board this evening um, and I'll just I'll just read this regarding our pu public engagement opportunities we provide two different opportunities um, during our meetings to speak before the board all speakers must fill out a form indicating their desire to speak if you wish to speak during tonight's open forum you may do so with respect to items that are posted on tonight's agenda or any other matter you wish to share with the board Please know that Wisconsin's open meeting law prohibits the board from conducting business on matters brought during this open forum. The board also will permit public participation during agenda items that the Board of Education will be voting on as noted on the board's agenda. During this public participation time consistent with state and federal laws, board members may engage in dialogue with the speakers. In order that all voices are heard, the board will suspend engagement until all speakers have had a chance to speak. Um, and please keep your comments to five minutes. The timekeeper will let you know when your five minutes has ended. Uh, prior to starting your comments, please provide your name and address. Lastly, demonstrations during public comments, such as clapping or cheering in response to either public comments or statements made by board members are prohibited. At this time, I don't have um, any forms or any indication that anyone wants to speak at this time, so um, we will move to our teaching and learning agenda, and that will be facilitated by Ed Dorf. Uh, under item number one, discussion items, we have nothing, but we do have four items under two for discussion and public comment. The first being special education caseloads. Services and her team present information about caseloads. I believe, uh, Claudia, are you going to introduce your team? Yes. I have with me tonight. Excuse me. I have with me tonight on my left. Oh, thanks. <laughs> on my left over here, we have Nicole Schubert, who is the special education supervisor for the Preble Quad. Next to her, we have Nikki Sheedy, <laughs> very confusing, <clears throat> who is the special education supervisor for the East Quad. To my right, I have Patrick Dillhunt, who is the supervisor for the Southwest Quad, and Sean Manders O'Brien, who is the supervisor for 
the West Quad. Um, you might ask, where are my two associates? And um, unfortunately, Dara was at a conference on mental health. Dara Atandari is my uh, associate for the East Side. She is at a conference on mental health today. And Julie Harris, her daughter, made uh, regionals in golf. And so she's a senior. She wanted to make sure that she was able to be with her daughter if she moved on to the state one, I believe, or the nationals or something. So nonetheless, I still have my four fabulous supervisors with me who are there here to support me in our presentation. Um, you ask why are we here, what are we talking about? What we're gonna talk about is in three steps today. We're gonna talk about the history of where the caseloads came from, uh, what our current practice is, and then the next steps moving forward. So, let me give you some background. When I first got here in 2011, caseloads were supposed to be FTEs. They had started out being FTE based. Um, and we'll get into that later, a little bit later. An FTE is full, um, full, term, uh, I don't know, full time equivalent, excuse me. Um, <laughs> thanks, you can tell me what I'm doing wrong, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> teachers also had uh, all students on their caseloads. So there were students with emotional behavioral disabilities, there were students with learning disabilities, and there were students with cognitive, or what is now called intellectual disabilities, all on their caseloads. And they had caseloads 8, 10, 12, 14. Um, majority of their time was being spent chasing down the kids with the em emotional behavioral disabilities. The students with the uh, um, intellectual disabilities were sitting, were um, being serviced as best as they could not being able to reach or understand the content, and then the students with learning disabilities were um, getting pull-out time as needed. But the, I do want to take uh, say that there were some pull-out classes for the students with intellectual disabilities that were significant, but there were still students with mild and moderate cognitive dis intellectual disabilities that were being on the same caseloads as the, all of those other students. So when I got here, I spent that whole year looking at what was going on, and the following year we made some changes where we added behavior focus rooms. We um, have since added autism focus rooms mm -hmm. so that those teachers can be trained more thoroughly. They have smaller class sizes. They can deal with the behaviors at hand um, and, and meet everybody's needs even better. So. What was again happening back then was every time there was an issue with a student in a classroom, the special education teacher who was trying to teach students with intellectual disabilities or specific learning disabilities had to stop everything they were doing and run into a regular classroom and uh, get that student out or de-escalate that student and the class was being left with parents. Um, the teachers told me that that wasn't making any sense for them and that's why I made the changes of having the more, um, the smaller settings for some kids with more significant needs. Um, around 2012 or 13, when I, I talked to HR, Human Resources, and there was really no staffing formula. So what had happened is if a student had come to a classroom, a particular student had come to a classroom, a para would, um, and the student needed extra help, a para was added. Unfortunately, there was not a tracking of okay, now that student left the district and so um, the para was taken out. So there was a lot of inequities across the district around who had what and who didn't have what. So we came up with a process. And what I decided to do was look at the process. DPI has two different processes that Nicole, Nikki will get into later, but there, one of them was going straight by numbers and one was going by um, the FTE. I chose to go with straight by numbers because it was the most simplistic one to understand. What you have up there is what we decided was going to, what the DPI had recommended and what we decided for elementary, middle, and high school cross-cat teachers. That would have meant elementary is 12 to 14, middle 15 to 17, and high school 18 to 20. Um, I attached in there a letter, the letter that, the latest letter that went out that, um, we don't have a cursor, so I can't go down to that. But um, 
the staffing letter that was sent out to the teachers for last year, every single year since we've had this, we have um, put the caseloads out there for teachers to see. We also have- Excuse um, me, our, our link is different. Uh, the link we have on, on Neptune is, has a district comparison chart. Oh. Mm -hmm. Do you have it? We'll share. We'll share this. We put it in a different place, and I thought okay. when we were working on it today to finalize it, I think we um, uh, we changed some things, and I guess I didn't realize it wouldn't change in Neptune. I apologize. But as you can see, we had staffing ratios for the that the letter went out to the to the different staff. <laughs> you want to go back to the PowerPoint? Yes, please. Those, those staffing um, ranges are coming from the Department of Public Instruction reflecting Correct. best practice? Is Correct. That, okay. Just the thing, one sure. thing to be noted is the Department of Public Instruction's <coughs> recommended numbers for caseloads and or FTE do not include the addition of a paraprofessional in the classroom. Okay. Just the teacher? Just the teacher to student ratio. Correct. How did they come up with that? Do you know? It was a whole, they take stakeholders and in input and they, they have a, the state superintendent has a, a committee that has stakeholders from parents, students, teachers, um, advocates all on the committee and they give recommendations to the superintendent. Um, for our specialty programs, there was not a guideline around that necessarily for the Department of Public Instruction. So we made some decisions based on what I had um, incur had in my previous district and at the time what this, my associate at the time, Amy um, Walkwitz had at her previous district and we came up with eight as a, for elementaries for the autism focused, behavior focused and students with intellectual disability focused classrooms. 10 for the autism behavior and ID focus, and 12 for the autism behavior and ID focus at the high school. <coughs> Each program has one teacher and at least one additional para. The ID programs, for the most part, if they're severe, they have two adults, in two paraprofessionals in them. The behavior and the autism classrooms generally have one additional para designated to that classroom um, unless it's students with significant autism as well as intellectual disabilities. Uh, Claudia, as a follow-up, the caseload is different than the classroom. Yes, no? I'm not understanding your question. Oh, Number cross cat versus specialty yes, programs. Yes, Correct. But, but is it when you talk caseload, <coughs> are we saying that that teacher will have 12 to 14 students every class period? And then is this by class period or caseload or both? Okay, sure. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. So these programs, these programs, especially programs, are students that spend at least 60 to at least 60 percent of their day self-contained in a special education classroom. So this, on these caseloads, these teachers have these students every single hour throughout the day. On the previous one, when you're looking at the elementary, the middle, and the high school cross categorical, they do not have 12 to 14 in a self-contained classroom all day. It's mostly students who are being pushed in to regular education classrooms, pulled out for their area of need, if it's uh, literacy, if it's math, if it's behavior, whatever they're pulling them in, and some of them are going into the regular classrooms and supporting in the classrooms. So generally, they do not have those those kids with them ever for all the whole day as a class. Uh, we could probably use a little bit more explanation for, or clarification for that uh, because we're talking apples and apples, but different kinds of apples here. Caseload, uh, students that they're seeing in the classroom, uh, we'll start with the premise of, of uh, an elementary school. Uh, a special ed teacher might be sitting, in fact, anywhere, K-12, a teacher might be seeing and serving children who are not on her caseload, right? Um, <clears throat> generally that doesn't happen in elementary, but it does happen, it has happened in middle and high school, correct. Well, I know it does happen. So what, what is the uh, 
what does it mean to have a student on your caseload? What does that mean to the teacher? There are 12 or 14 <coughs> students on my caseload. I'm the teacher, what does that mean? What's my responsibility to those specific 12 to 14 children? Sure, you need to make sure that all of their accommodations and modifications are shared with all of their regular education teachers. You need to be monitoring their progress and um, writing their IEPs, which are done at least annually. And someone's giving directed services. So in a high school in particular, there might be an English, somebody's in an English department, so they have a special education teacher attached to the English department. She sees all the students that go through the English, um, through her, the English class that she's supporting. If it's math, they go through all of the math. But they have to keep in constant collaboration and um, communication with one another so that they ensure that they're um, nipping anything in the bud that's coming up. And do the, uh, uh, the case managers, the, the teachers who have the caseloads, are there some um, additional responsibilities they have for their students at transition points? Going from elementary to middle, middle to high school, high school, graduation, transition plans is what I'm talking about. I, I guess I don't necessarily understand the question. When you're transitioning a student from elementary to middle or middle to high, generally one of the teachers takes the lead on that and does a lot of the, um, the paperwork of sending the, the current IEP to the next, to the grade up, and then um, and sh planning transition meetings for them to go from elementary to middle or middle to high. Once a student is 14, they have to have transition, uh, a PTP, which is a post-transition post plan. So it's like a post-transition, uh, I didn't put PTP on here, did we? post-secondary post transition, plan. transition plans, excuse me. Um, and that's for any student 14 and above. Every time you have an IEP, you have to do a transition plan with them. Yeah, thanks. I was just trying to get, uh, and, and you, you, you answered the question. I just wanted to have uh, more information, more clarification about what, what it means to have a caseload, what, what those responsibilities sure. are. So thank you. And when Turned I say up. that those other ones are self-contained, that is their caseload. They have eight students on their caseload. Go ahead, Brendan. Uh -huh. So, um, just so I'm clear, so um, you mentioned the language arts special ed teacher, the math special ed teacher, and you, are you talking about team teaching or not necessarily when you said the support? It's not? Um, there's different models out there that we could get into in a different day, okay. but many times it's team teaching, sometimes it's uh, uh, they're doing more of the pair, the pairs are going in and supporting for the team teaching, and the teacher is working on the interventions and closing gaps and okay. the actual ins instruction in the self-contained class. So if a, if a student is getting special education support in language arts and math, are they on two different teachers' caseloads? Or one of them takes One of them is the their IEP uh, teacher and is the one who's like their case manager okay, so but they the might case. see the Eng the one teacher for English and the other one for math right correct but, but that student only gets counted once in a caseload they're either, correct they've got an IEP teacher and that's mm -hmm. correct <coughs> Rhonda so when you're calculating the FTE are you using para time in order to calculate the, the amount of time that kids are <coughs> in the FTE nope no, it's never counted? We've not counted it, no. We've just gone strictly by the guidance, but we've added additional para time. Okay. Anyways. Mr. Dorn, mm -hmm. uh, I just sent via email the updated slideshow for the board members and oh, Dr. Sure. Langenfeld and asked Sandy Heller if she could please update that too at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that in mind, we started having feedback probably about a year and a half, two years ago from the teachers and the principals that going strictly by numbers wasn't telling the story. They felt that we should go back to the FTE. Um, and if you look at some of our schools, if you went strictly by FTE, which again, Nikki will go into explaining that, you could have had, you could have upward of 20 some kids on your caseload. We didn't want to do that. So what we wanted to do was look at the FTEs 
and look at the ca at the total numbers and still keep a, a maximum amount of numbers on the case so so that you didn't get too many kids but you still kind of evened out the FTEs so again we looked at s the student needs and supporting the whole student and making sure that their needs were being met So our, <clears throat> our current practice then was taking a combination, like Claudia said, of the DPI recommended caseload sizes and then their weighted FTE calculator where it takes the student's FTE and puts them into a code ABC <clears throat> and gives them a weighted FTE number that's equivalent to, say, a general ed student um, without a disability. So you could have a student, a special ed student that could be equivalent to two general ed students within their classroom. So DPI is saying that their recommended number for a general ed class would be 25 to 29 students. So then looking at a special ed case, both we want to keep around that same size. Um, Can I just explain what yeah. A, B, and C, you want to explain A, B, and C? So each code, A is the least restrictive environment code. So they're in the regular ed setting um, the most, the zero to 20% of their day. Um, 21 to is it 59% is code B, and then 60% <coughs> or higher is code C. So here's the DPI link that breaks down the codes in the formula. If you go to the weighted FTE, yeah. here's what we sent out to um, our building administrators last year when we were getting prepared to do our staffing. So you can see what the environmental code A, B, and C is, and they're the students weighted FTE based on disability area and grade level. And that weighted number is, like I said, equivalent, what DPI is saying is equivalent to a regular ed student without any disability. Our next step was looking at the surrounding districts around us to see what their caseload sizes were. So we were working in comparison to them. Let's see. That's you look down on. This is from 2017-18. They are working on updating it for the 18-19 school year. And you can see on row, I think it's nine, is a special ed to special ed student ratio. It's the link on our page too. So you can see that we're one, we're the green column, column B, one to 15.7. We're right within the range, um, more on the lower end compared in comparison to the surrounding districts. And then it's to be noted that majority of the surrounding districts don't have specialty classrooms like behavior focus or intellectual disability focus or um, autism focus. Many of them, ex with the exception of um, uh, Seymour, use uh, students with more significant disabilities go to civil hop. So they are not included in that, um, their ratios. Then um, to calculate the full-time equivalency or the FTE, it's the total amount of special education services, amount of special education services that the student is receiving, the direct instruction from that special education teacher, divided by the total um, time in the school day or week, however that teacher is calculating it. And then that will come up with the FTE. Um, a misconception when we moved to the FTE model was that um, the teachers were thinking, administration thought that the FTE was all pull-out classes. So we were moving away from the special ed students being in the general ed setting and wanting them to be in pull-out. 
that that's a misconception. The special education services, or FTE, can be provided in both regular education and special education. So we put in a example of a service of all special education setting, and this particular student has a 39% FTE, which would put them in code, environmental code B. Here's an example of a student that receives services in both special education setting and the regular education setting, and their FTE is 18%, um, which would be an environmental code A. Next step is after <coughs> the FT student FTE is calculated, we have to determine the weighted FTE um, based on their environmental code and their service FTE. We add all of the weighted FTE up per caseload and determine if the F weighted FTE lands between that 25 to 29. And after we have that, we determine if it lands within that range, the caseload number range. <coughs> so if you click on the example, actually um, did an example caseload. So here I just put, pulled out the disability areas, um, each student's FTE is in the middle column, and then what their weighted FTE um, is equivalent to. If you scroll down for me, please. So this teacher in particular has 12 students on their case though. The total weighted FTE is 26.3. So looking at that, they could carry up to 14, but based on their weighted FTE, we would say we want to monitor this and determine if they would need additional support or not. So it's in this, it is fair <laughs> to say that caseloads change throughout the year. When is this like what is the threshold when you actually say we need to add more support and how often does that happen we're in the process we look at it multiple times in the year we set our caseloads at the end like in february of last year um and we all know that students move starting we've spent the beginning part of the year waiting for third friday to come up um, and we are at a point where we are moving staff to accommodate the needs in buildings on the move will happen on Monday. I need everybody to understand that moving people after the school year has started has not been a pleasant thing for anybody. Um, but we've made sure that um, there's been communications with the, the staff and everyone involved. Um, the union has been involved and HR has been involved. But we do, right now, we're, we are finishing up the conversations with the people that are being affected and um, have an effective move date of Monday of the 8th. Um, we would look again after third Friday in January. Um, sometimes principals come to us and say, oh my gosh, I just got four kids from such and such a place. We would look at that and um, look at how we could manage to support that person. And has it ever happened where you actually cannot add support? If someone's asked for it, has it ever been where you actually can't add support? I don't. Yeah, because we post positions throughout the school year. So, and in the past, what if they were no positions? One of our staff covered for teachers. So. I, so no. To the best of my knowledge, okay. no. So an administrative or supervisory staff covered if you were unable or not yet able to fill a teacher or a teacher was taking longer than expected to fill? Um, we've had program support teachers cover. We've had psychologists cover. We've had retired people cover. We've had my administrative team cover. However, we can get that. Last year I had staff in a school um, at least two months because we couldn't find a teacher. Now, if you're asking me if people have asked for additional case, uh, additional staff, and when we looked and examined all the needs, we didn't feel there was a need for it, yes, we may have said no to that. How often that does mean. that happen? <sighs> are, are most, are 90% of requests granted? Are a lot of requests not granted? 
I would sort of say I, I think it's more of a, a it's situational, and so that's why uh, if you're if we're doing anything, we're we're thinking about those individual situations. So um, in that situation, we will always look to exhaust all resources within a building before we look at potentially moving somebody. Um, look at maybe changing if it's secondary caseloads or not, not caseloads. I said that it could be someone's schedule. There's there's multiple pieces. So to consider all levels first before we make that next step. So that's why I, I'm thinking that between the three of us here, we're we're stumbling over a little bit. We we literally try to consider all options. And um, our teachers, I can tell you, our teachers will work just as hard to say. If we do this, maybe we can get that additional time to support that student. Maybe it's a matter of condensing. Um, things change. Two kids may have transferred out earlier, and now we have new two kids transferring in. Things that we thought were solidified for what we had in, in November may need to be looking different in January. So we look through all those examples. Mr. And Kasha, can you I share would, it all? I was just going to share. How much we've increased special yes. education staffing in the last two years? 14.5% in the last three years. Go right yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You have all the numbers. Claudia, but could you speak to, yeah. I mean, the process that typically occurs and how you bring forward your requests and to the board? Yeah. Okay. I mean, to the cabinet? Sure. Yeah. And the executive directors and talk sure. about and when needs come forward and discussions are held. So even with the formulas we have, even though students, our student population of students with disabilities has decreased over the last three years, we have increased every single year um, for the last three years. And um, what we do is we, we do all of those, we exhaust all of our uh, opportunities to rearrange staff and schedules and whatnot help them to look at it and problem solve. The supervisors would come to uh, Julia or Dara, one last chance, Can, is there any ideas you have? We bring in program support teachers, provide ideas there. Um, if that is not, if we still feel that there's a need, we would send a request to Vicki and she would take that to cabinet to review. Generally, I don't believe that cabinet has ever said no to any of our requests. Many of them are related to making sure we're meeting the IEP, um, the minutes that are outlined in the IEP. On top of the staff that we've added, paras and teachers, we've also added uh, last year, we at one point or another, and I won't say they were there all year long, but at one point or another, there were 22 students who had one-to-one -one paras with them throughout the school year. So clearly, I'm, we're trying to meet the needs of all the students and all the staff. We're responding if a student is new and they came with a pair in their IEP, we're giving them a pair right away until we can evaluate the situation, um, fading the pairs when needed, um, documenting all of that. Is that what you're? Well, I, I, yeah, if I could just, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's really important is that we're meeting the needs of children. Mm -hmm. And I think um, John and I have, John Cash and I have talked about the importance of not only fulfilling the IEP, but our responsibility to support our children. And so to that end, again, like you said, some of our children are presenting some pretty high needs, and we, and we recognize that. And I know that Vicki will bring forward requests, and we look, and obviously I always feel, and I've said this to Vicki, and I've said it to Claudia, if you're coming forward, I know that this has been vetted out, and you've done what you needed to do. Um, to make sure that you're building capacity among staff because to be able to deliver. But the 14 some percent, I mean, it's millions of dollars. It's not like it's, it's you know, it's a lot of staff. Um, and it's not, not for not wanting to do it. But it, but it is a, a very important um, balance to make sure that the children have what they need and the teachers are well supported. But sometimes the support um, also needs to come in professional development mm -hmm. um, as well because these are these are often sometimes being presented when you talk case by case Pat I think about just the unique needs of each and every child it doesn't always look the same uh, to support that child and we've also increased our use of um, outside agencies supporting the students when we feel that um, they 
are to a point where they're endangering the safety of themselves or others and even a, a place like Minoka isn't uh, appropriate. We've got currently, uh, I think we have 11 students at Advocates for Healthy Transitional Living right now and about to have two students at Mock Village Program and one student at <coughs> Curative or Curative Connections. Oh, curative connections. And then, yeah, one's getting a, a robot, which is for another day. Uh, so, John, do you want to speak to, I don't know if it matters the dollar amount, but. Well, it's not a bad one. I'll tell you, $6 million over the last three years, 14.5%. This year alone, an 8% increase. Last year, 5.5%. So short term, that's, that's the commitment that's changed over the last two to three years. So um, I guess my, my question was a little bit more specific about how often, how often teachers request extra support and are told no, that are told no, we think you're fine. And I'm not, I'm not, my goal here is not to, you know, have you tell me that, you know, two-thirds of the time we agree and so how you're letting down teachers no I mean sometimes teachers are gonna make a request for something that is not needed right that's why we have that's why we have some and I know that there's some judgment calls that are made at the same time I would think if we <coughs> routinely had teachers coming forward saying they need some relief paras etc and we're, we're being told that we didn't have it available, then I think that would be, you know, I think probably most, most of the time teachers are making a, you know, a sensible request and not trying to, you know, not trying to get off easy. If they did want to, did want to have it easy, they would choose a different line of work, obviously. So just how often are we, how often are requests being answered with, with no? I can personally only, over the last number of years that I've been here, I can't even think of five, of a handful of them. So all the almost all of the teacher requests that come to you go I to I don't cabinet? generally get teacher requests. They usually come from the principal who's vetted it out. If there's a teacher who had a, well right now we're working with a teacher who is um, concerned about their caseload. Um, we're looking at options for that teacher going to the principal to say, I think that this needs to be reorganized so that this person has less kids on a caseload, this one has more on a caseload. I think that's generally the way it goes. I don't, if teachers, I don't even recall any teachers coming directly <coughs> to me, except for itinerant. Christina. So do you collect that data year over year in terms of inquiries about additional support and whether or not your that fits your fits your you know your assessment or if it doesn't like do you do you carry that data and you analyze that <coughs> no we keep the data of who and where we added staff but I, not who gets which I don't even like I said I I can't even recall any of that any of them. I well, I'm, I'm just yeah. also curious too, like if somebody says, I would like to look into this, and then you say, no, there's been, my assessment says we don't need additional support. It would just be interesting. I'm just curious if you had that data. I just, it would be interesting to see when classroom teachers ask how so, often yeah. that is an actual need. All right. I believe part of the reason I think we are struggling mm -hmm. with that specific type of a question of when do you say no mm -hmm. is because by design, our nature is to look for solutions. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have an IEP mm -hmm. which is directing us with a specific need, mm -hmm. and because that r relates from <coughs> this is the child's ability, strengths, mm -hmm. weaknesses, that goes to that next part, that we have goals, mm -hmm. it directs us to um, services mm -hmm. related to those needs, and so because of that need, we're looking for solutions to provide them what's required. Sure. And that's why I'm saying need repeatedly because mm -hmm. we want to go there. We, we often stumble between we all could benefit from mm -hmm. some additional mm -hmm. things, but it's the need. So through that conversation, as an IEP teacher, 
to being all these many roles leading up to here today, I can tell you that we truly try to vet out options first to get the need covered. Our goal is to get those needs covered. So I find it hard to say that I've said no to them because I'm always in the process of trying to find a solution. Can, and, and that's why it gets those many pieces sure. of can we adjust doing this? So that's why I'm stumbling over this to tell you how many <coughs> we've said no to. I just yeah, and my question. It's never a hard, it's it's never a it's hard no. We always go in and find some sort of solution. It may not be exactly what the teacher or the principal was originally wanting, mm -hmm. but there is at the end always a resolution that comes to fruition, and mm -hmm. that's just how it goes. Yeah, and my question isn't because I don't think you're filling that need. I'm just curious how it would be interesting if that data was there to say, this happened and this often this happens or this often we this is what that. happens. So we can do that moving forward. forward. Rhonda? I'm just wondering without that kind of um, data how you would actually look to ask for more support from the district or the board if you didn't actually have that data how you would maybe come and ask for more funding. I don't understand that. your question. Right. I mean, do you know what I mean? So if you don't really know where your needs are, or if you would, if inevitably, I would vote to give you as much support as I could every single time I can. But if that data isn't collected, how many times you're actually asked to have for something that maybe you have to, like you said, find ways to fill and finagle around, then how do you really know what your needs are financially or fiscally? Let me, let me just, uh, if, if I could, uh, uh, Kind of from a practitioner point of view, uh, albeit uh, several years removed, there are a number of levels of, of requests here, and if we were looking for data, I guess we'd have to say, at what level do you want? Do you want that? Do you want the, the data coming from when the requests go to the ultimate decision makers at that cabinet, or at the at the first level, at the teacher level? If we start at the teacher level, or the classroom level, I, I think what's been alluded to here is that within the school. Uh, my experience has been the teachers are going to try to find solutions. The teachers and the principals are going to try to find solutions, uh, shifting uh, sh shifting caseloads, if that's the right term, uh, shifting responsibilities to try to make sure that, not sure, to say, try to make sure, to make sure, to ensure that kids' IEP needs are being met. So something might come up as a request for more, or a, uh, a statement that more services or more help is needed, but they're able to figure that out internally. I mean, that's, that's at the closest level to the, to the work itself. So a request has been made, but they've solved it themselves in the school, and that happens oh. multiple times. Mm -hmm. Now, take it to the next step. Uh, if the teacher comes to the learning assistance team or whatever they have in the, in the buildings, uh, what's done at that point? Does it move on from there? Mm -hmm. So I, I think to, to ask the question about what's the data, uh, we have to talk about at what level. Going from the building to downtown or from downtown to upper administration um, you know so sure. at the lowest level it's yep. going to be very very hard to dig that out because people are addressing those things in house go ahead please. so it's entirely possible that is this is this impossible to say that they figure this out in house because they don't really feel confident about getting it outside of their purview so maybe they just figure it out because it's easier Maybe it's more of a hassle to actually go into the next level and ask for help. I, I don't think that's accurate. I don't think um, that's I, fair. It, well, that, I, that may happen, Rhonda, but it does, you know, again, my, my experience is it's, these it's folks are working that it very, happens. very hard to get these things done, and yep, their mindset and I, is to and I agree with you, make but these things happen. I'm just, again, I'm a voice, and I'm sh using my voice to share a voice. Um, so when that does happen, I think that's the, the concern. And so based on that, I wouldn't, and what we're talking about collectively, I'd wonder how do you determine when you need to ask for more funding? What is it that actually happens? Because that's, an, at the end of it all, that's what I'm interested in, is when do you know that you need to ask for more? So when their numbers are over the number that we recommend and their FTE is over what the recommended FTE, we would look to ask for support. And so, and if do you have that? Do you have that data? Like how often that happens? Mm -hmm. I have all the ads. Correct. Yes, mm -hmm. and I also have. And maybe if what you're alluding to, because um, I'm not totally understanding what you're alluding to, because majority of our asks have been yeses. Mm -hmm. But 
if, if you're looking at when people are asking for one-to-one -one paras, there used to be this practice of they said they wanted a para, they got a para. What we're asking for now is what we ask for when we ask for additional, any additional support in reading and math, we ask for the data. What have you done? What data have you collected? What have you tried? We bring in the autism focused persons if that's the, if the need is autism, we bring in the academic or the behavior. Focus program support teachers help them to understand how to examine the data, how to stay on a, um, try an intervention, how to document that intervention. Um, and once that's all done, and they've done that, and they've provided me with the paperwork, one-to-one -one pairs I've been assigned. And as I said, 22 over the last last year alone, when it, I first got here, I think we had two one-to-ones. And no documentation of that, because when a student left the district, the pair just stayed there. So um, we're trying to do a better job of that. If there's something, uh, idea you have for us to make teachers feel more comfortable coming to us, I'd be more than happy to take that suggestion. Well, I'm just, I mean, and I'm just looking at also the people that have left and resigned. So there is a fair amount of that. So I'm just curious about how this all works. It seems really seamless. There's a fair amount of people who have resigned in many of the districts around us also. And I, so. and, I, and I agree with that, and I know that. So I'm just wondering, in general, how we are approaching this to obviously take care of that in some form, as well as the kids. Well, Pat's going on to the, uh, he's got that in his presentation, so. <laughs> If, the, if, the, if this applies, I'll just say your, your question may be, um, if we can click, I think I have control of this one now. Um, um, going on to this next step. Um, the, the next step, so really, um, maybe Rhonda, this is where you're alluding to right here, is that the fact is that we are aware that um, we have this process we've been ongoing. And you can hear from my description how I think we have a, a sense of how we proceed. We also are acknowledging, though, that there, there's the need out there for more. And so to create a, a building administrative team to make sure that we have the principal voice, um, to make sure that that's representing the classroom voice. Um, we as supervisors are in the building. We are having conversations with our teachers and supporting them. We are part of those, as I say, part of those solution teams, looking for those solutions team. And we know we need to do some additional work. I think that's what this is acknowledging is that again, I'm bringing what I know, right? But I also are acknowledging what we don't know, in other words, and try to move it forward. So our goal is to get that team going. And the second part is that it, um, ongoing additional coaching of the staff, staff, what specifically is changed from DPI process, which is affecting our process, is this whole conversation around disability-related needs. That is where we are trying truly to have our conversations, about that individual need, look at um, strengths, weaknesses, services mm -hmm. to get to that need, and then how do we go to the next step? And that truly, that conversation should be happening first, and that's why, or that's how it equals to that FTE. It should be based on what the need is, and that's what we're going forward. And I can tell you from the teachers that I talk to, this is where they truly feel their professionalism comes into play, which is writing that IEP, knowing the family, knowing the child, creating that IEP, putting it all together and going forward. And that's at a school level. That's a teacher-based level, those IEPs. That's, that's there. So, and that comes to the FTE, which eventually comes forward to this larger conversation we're having about staffing when we put it all together for one staff with an FT, a caseload of, you know, 12 to 14 or things like that. I would say that, you know, what you just said there reflects back. What I was speaking of before, Rhonda, was of my experiences, and that's not to say that, you know, what you're talking about doesn't exist. I'm not suggesting that at all. But if we have pockets of that, that's, that has to be brought forward. If teachers are believing that their needs aren't being represented, more specifically, more importantly, the kids' needs aren't being represented and brought forward, that really needs to come out because that, that's not okay. Uh, and, again, I was speaking to my experience, and seeing teachers problem solve around a lot of these things and I believe that's still going on but you know if there are those pockets mm -hmm. that needs to be brought forward. Brenda you had a hand up before do you have a comment? No. I mean I might have oh forgot it. <laughs> Andrew? Lori can you pull, pull up the current GVAPS case? Yeah. 
also. And I just got Yes. So I guess another another point too that I guess is important to me is I would want to make sure that requests that are coming forward, whether it's from from teacher to principal, from principals to um, to you, um, I'm not. I'm not saying that or suggesting that the answer would be yes all the time, but I think I would. It would be my hope that there wouldn't be too much. How can I put it? Self-censoring of requests. Um, boy, I know they're having a hard time already filling some of these positions. I can do it. We can do it here. We're not. We're not going to ask other other people. A very, um, I I see it in my line of work in a much in much less serious of matters. But you know, hey, why didn't you call me? We could have helped you out here. Oh no, you're you're busy. Your time's valuable. You, I know that so and so place needs more help. That kind of thing, and it, it's hard to. I don't know the. I don't know the solution to it, but I would I would be surprised if it I would be surprised if it didn't happen. Now, if if it turns out what truly you know, if people truly felt that to really do what we need to do, you know, we needed a forty or fifty percent more staff, we might have to make a decision of okay, we can't we can't do that, but maybe where can we meet you know the most urgent need? That's my I guess my biggest worry is what what are the questions that aren't aren't getting asked that are getting self self censored if you want one of those earlier mm -hmm. levels. So I do know with our four supervisors now that we have on in place, they're looking at caseloads every month and they're looking at the numbers and they're looking at the FTEs. Um, and while we were doing this third Friday thing, there is a per one of our schools that has said and they generally say this to us all the time, no, no, we can make it work, we can make it work. Um, because we want, we're looking at the whole district as a whole, we're telling them, you can't make it work. We're not gonna let you make it work because we're giving you more staff. And they're appreciative when we give them that, but they're, you know, we also have principals, we have teachers that all do feel that, oh, we can make it work, we can make it work. There's bigger needs, there's bigger needs. No, their FTE shows that they need more support. So we're giving it to them. And, and I hope it's not just the FTE. I would hope that in the critical examination of behavioral and, and learning data, that leadership is making those determinations as well. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I, I like what you said there. You know, you're looking at these things and saying, no, you do need help in bringing it in. Um, but I mean, that would be my my response to to the question you asked. That you know, that it's incumbent on the leadership by looking at what's going on in the classrooms. Again, looking at the data direct observation to, to make those determinations um, to overcome that, that you know, self-censoring that you talked about. It shouldn't be happening. I think I can add that it's, it's so crucial in my position that I think it's so crucial for myself to be in a position where I'm being very purposeful about my relationship building with this building level staff and that leadership so they feel comfortable to share that with me. So I think that's one of our goals is always to have strong culture and climate and trust so that we can have that very open and collaborative communication. That's good, that's good to hear that uh, you're doing some, you know, some push down since, because I think a lot of, there's just probably going to be, a, especially in the profession like teaching, there's just, always going to be a lot of we'll we'll take care of it go help you know so all right thank you I have one more question uh, we'll go to Michelle and then okay. Brenda and then Rhonda just, okay. just as a as a follow-up um, you know I think one of the opportunities that and Ed you spoke to it very well is that I more and more often um, central office is really going in and doing direct observations when requests are made. Um, I think because of the unique needs that children are presenting, even though we have fewer students in the district right now who are receiving services, there are many times where, you know, your initial response is what we used to do, um, you know, whether it be a one-on-one -on -one pair or whatever, but even going in and looking more deeply because sometimes the issues are even greater 
than what people have seen. So, I mean, I have really respected and appreciated. Sometimes teams have gone over with the executive director and the principal, and a whole team has gone in and several observations to make sure that we have the right resources and support. Um, so I know a lot of care goes into those decisions when you want to make sure that the fit is the best. Um, as, as a follow-up, though, with the one-on-one -on -one para, um, the, con the conversation and in, in sitting at the IEP table many times in my years as principals, we talked about the one-on-one -on -one para being a pretty restrictive measure. Correct. Um, are you, are you, is that still part of the conversation and why that would be so that sometimes it sounds like a really good idea and people may not know how that works for a student to have right, that one Right, because on -one. when you have a one-to-one, -one, generally um, all natural relationships with peers is absent because there's always this adult around. Um, so one of the things that we ask the teams to do while they are getting the one-to-ones is to have give us their plan of what they're going to do to teach the behaviors so that the student can begin to fade the one-to-one -one support so that by the time they're in high school you're not walking around with a body next to you 24-7 so that is part of the IP is the plan to fade I think Michelle makes a very good point though that we have two guardrails the students needs but then also least restrictive environment and that you know the the best answers are usually between there because more it becomes more restrictive and then that's not the best for the children either so that's always the thoughtfulness as we vet through that process Brenda? Well, as I listen I'm just struck by the fact that I don't think that this can ever become a numbers game and a, a game of, of just pure data I mean, I think you've put a lot of data to it with, with your FTE calculations and, and all of that, which is really good to hear because that gives you that, the, the catch, so to speak, of you know, constantly um, evaluating those numbers. But the, the rest of what you do is just an art of, of case by case, teacher by teacher, student by student. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the work you've done to try to um, improve your ability to do that part because that part's harder than the than just crunching numbers and um, so just being in classrooms and getting to know teachers and students I think that that to me that sounds like you know the best way to improve that that part of the job that you're doing so thanks Rhonda um, so I just wanted to say that I had visited uh, West and Lombardi autism focus programs and I just couldn't get over how much of a game changer you can tell that these programs are for kids and I, I just can't say enough about that. Um, I'm not sure, are these located in all of the middle and high schools right now? Um, we're moving to the part that um, we're trying to build the capacity. So we have them at Lombardi, Southwest, West, West Franklin, Franklin Washington. Washington, and East. And Preble is, and at, are they starting this year? Oh, Edison started this year, not Preble. Because it's, you have to build the teacher capacity also mm -hmm. to be able to understand how to deal with students on the spectrum. And um, we, we've put a lot of effort and a lot of work into working with students with autism in our district over the last five years. It was, it was really interesting to hear because they actually had me come in and I, they presented to me and they all discussed the students about- students did, correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, it was great. They talked about how this actually has changed their life, their school experience, their student achievement is um, increased, their behaviors have decreased. It was just, it was great. Christina? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. My question about data is not to say that there's not an art to this work that you all do. But I do think it's important that when, you know, like I love this last step here, you know, bringing teachers to the table, your budget is increasing, you're thinking about systems, you're thinking about how you improve. You know, form follows function. And as you build that out, I think we should always be thinking about how we can improve our systems so that we can integrate flexibility to be, have a, a creative lens through the work that we do. But if we want to really think about teacher input and sort of rising those voices to the top, um, Data is a really important piece that tells us, can tell us something that we may not see. 
Um, so I would just encourage you as you are thinking about how you build out this administrative team to, to really give uh, these teachers a voice to what they would like, how they would like to use data and how they could use that in a way that's really meaningful that really uh, enhances their work. So I just wanted to be clear with why I was asking that no, question. No, I understood. I had it written down as a note to figure out a way to do that too. I think, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Do you have any other questions? Anything more? I just wanted to put your my uh, your attention to the attachment that was on slide um, four, I believe it was, where we actually built out, showed you the caseloads. We left the names of the students of the teachers off, and we left the names of the schools off. But we do, in our own possession, have the those on here. And as you can see, there are no there are no staff members that have anything higher than six. There's one, te the teacher at Preble has 22 and we're looking at working at East, excuse me, working with her because she's the one who won't take those kids off her caseload so we're having to nudge, nudge her a little bit but she's the repo teacher in the department chair and she's very protective. Um, the ones that have 16, those are the ones where you're gonna know that we're moving to add t uh, support over to those schools. So um, we do constantly look at the numbers but I, th I think it, at a previous board meeting that it was just it was said that there was 23 on a caseload. I even checked my itinerant kit teachers caseloads, and I don't have any of them with 23 on a caseload. So if somebody does have that, I, we would need to know about it. I mean, it, I encourage them to come forward. The only thing we could have thought was that a principal rearranged and said, "You're, you know, we we staff based on the FTE of the whole building and say." All the Crosscat teachers should have about this many students. Um, it might not work out because of grade levels. So we encourage anybody who's, um, if they do have something like that, they think their case is unfair. Please, please figure a way to get that to us, even if it's through a board member. Um, however, we can do that. I, th I think it's important, and this was very, very <laughs> important. Uh, th this discussion and the information that was shared that we are clear on. Uh, the definitions, caseload, class size, FTE. Um, it's a very, very involved process, obviously, and, and uh, always moving. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Quick question. Please. Sorry. Um, a lot of professional development goes on. Can you just provide, I, just either a high level now or just put it in an update? I know there's a lot of professional development going on for our teachers, and I think that's a really critical part that we haven't talked anything about, and I don't, maybe that's for another time. Might yeah. be for another time. Just, we were okay. Because we do specific on academics, years. behavior, yeah. autism, I ID. I, yes. It's just even having that somewhere so that people could look. I think it's really important. Ms. Yeah, we, You're collecting that, correct? Correct. Right. Yeah, perfect. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to shift gears now. Uh, next item we have is uh, International Baccalaureate Mathematics, English, and Business Management Course Essential Documents. I see Mr. Freeze is working his way up to the table here. He's bringing Dr. Khan with him. <laughs> Everybody. Nice to see all of you. We're a little short-handed tonight, um, as you can tell, so I'm playing the part of uh, Mr. Magus and myself. But um, we uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here to share with you a couple requests for governance approval with some uh, curriculum documents. Um, tonight we are uh, here on behalf of the West team. It's actually <coughs> homecoming week, so uh, they, they weren't able to join us. They'll be here in a couple weeks, though, for an International Baccalaureate um, progress monitoring report so around voting time if there's things that we need to circle back around they will be present uh, for that this is a governance request related to our IB curriculum work the IB um, as you may know updates and overhauls curriculum occasionally um, based on changes internationally and, and, and looking at um, core competencies this month we bring forward a request for changes to the IB math course offerings based on a, pretty much a complete overhaul of what the IB will allow schools to offer in future years. In addition, uh, West is requesting to change its IB English offerings based on an analysis of recent changes by the IB and in line with its vision for 
courses that will be appealing, um, appealing to students and rigorous for its students. Finally, West is proposing to introduce an IB business uh, offering that will increase the overall diploma program options as well as link to the efforts associated with the Bailing Manufacturing Program. So tonight, uh, Dr. Eric Kahn is here uh, to elaborate a bit further on the purpose and intent of this request and provide any additional details. Uh, as always, we welcome your questions. Um, the, as far as the math goes, there are two courses that the IB uh, program is proposing for replacement or will be implementing for replacement. Um, starting next year. The, the first course is referred to as Applications and Interpretations, which um, they aim as uh, being beneficial to students who are pursuing further studies in post-secondary in economics, business, um, the social sciences. And then the other course is uh, ap Applications and Interpretations, which is more of preparing students for further advanced mathematics um, in getting into STEM-related fields. Uh, in the English, um, the West team is proposing to uh, retire the current IB English Literature course and replace that with IB English Languages and Literature. Uh, that course still does literary analysis, but also includes non-literary text in the analysis, focusing on uh, things such as language, culture, and context and its impact on communication. And then um, Mike also went over the proposal for business management, which would broaden the IB diploma program courses um, beyond the traditional core areas into the first um, CTE area in the business department. Brenda? <coughs> the, the math classes that you just listed, how do, what, um, what other, do they take the, the traditional math and then these are IB sort of high-level critical thinking math, or, or do these count as some of those more traditional, like algebra, geometry, algebra two kind of classes? Sure, um, they go traditionally through algebra, geometry, and algebra two, and these are more the replacement in the traditional pathway for things like um, pre-calculus and then calculus, depending on what how they exactly line up. What we don't know yet, because these courses are so brand new, is what they mean as far as post-secondary transfer, just because the post-secondary institutions haven't weighed in yet. On, on how those courses will be evaluated. So those are, I mean, they cover the, the content for pre-calc and calculus? Generally the same content, yes. It's just sort of a different approach to teaching it. Correct. Okay, thanks. The, the two applications and interpretation classes, the one is standard level and then the one is higher level, are those sequential or do you take one or the other, not both? You would take one or the other. It depends on um, what your emphasis is when, when you're pursuing the um, IB diploma. Anything else? Andrew. I guess, um, so you're, you're changing um, with the changes to the, the math course, that's not going to affect the diploma path at all? That's a, it would be the same. Um, uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, this is, the, the current courses will not be offered by the International Baccalaureate at large, and this is the replacement. So as they, as they tease out the exact expectations for school districts and the sequencing of how things are uh, transitioned out of, um, we would be able to navigate that, but this is a universal change that we don't have a say over per, per se. It, it's a matter of this is the new course that they're offering. So, oh, I, see. <coughs> I see, you're changing one. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I misread something. IB is changing its math course from one thing to another. Yes. It's not. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll move that forward then. Thank um, you. Can you stay here for the next one? Yeah, I'll stay. Course conversion, advanced biology to advanced placement biology. Um, this also is very. Um, well, I won't say very straightforward, but it, this does not involve bringing forward new curriculum documents for you to approve. Rather, it's a request for you to approve the offering of advanced placement biology uh, to replace the advanced biology which has historically been offered. As you may know, um, this conversation has taken place in various circles around the district for a number of years. A lot of people have asked, why have we not made advanced placement biology an offering? It's generally a pretty accessible course for students to pursue in the advanced placement. 
Last year, the Intercity Student Council <coughs> asked about it um, in particular in the spring. Our teachers have spent a number of years doing curriculum crosswalks and gradually aligning the advanced biology course towards that and we're ready to make that recommendation, that move. So we're, we're requesting a course conversion, essentially. And um, as you can see, we did include some budgetary requests associated with the professional learning that would be associated uh, with it. Um, at this time, uh, the selection of resources has not been made. Um, it's important that the staff attend the um, uh, IB, or sorry, the AP Summer Institute to understand any curricular changes that may be coming with advanced or with AP biology and, and currently approved list of, of books. Um, so that is the uh, that is the recommendation. And Alyssa can't be with us tonight. I apologize. So if there's a heavy duty science question, I may need to defer for um, and get back to. Can you ballpark how close the the current advanced biology is to the AP? Yes, I can. Um, I it was ranging around like 67 to 72 percent of curriculum coverage. Uh, we do have a handful of students each year that have opted to take the AP Biology test. Um, last year, five students chose to take it. Two cho two students earned an AP score of a three or higher, which would typically transfer to college credit. Um, but we've had. Um, We've had uh, between 100 and 140 students in the district enrolled in advanced biology each year. So by ensuring that the curriculum is aligned, then they would be better prepared and we anticipate more students would pursue that for college credit consideration then. Andrew? So that, um, like what would, I, I realize you, I'm sure you don't have the whole, I wouldn't expect you have the whole list here, but that seems like to be a lot of un, a lot of uncovered material that we're going to have to right, fit within the same time frame. So you're saying about seventy percent overlap? Because uh, so that's a lot, right? So what's missing? I don't have the exact topics that are missing. We have a crosswalk, but the the staff worked with Alyssa in preparation of submitting this request, and so they worked out. And they're, they've got, um, they'll be working on a core syllabus based on the, the AP that has to be submitted to meet approval so that they can ensure that coverage occurs over the course of um, the requisite time allotment for teaching. I presume you'd have to drop some topics too then because it would be challenging to just cram 30% more material into an already rigorous course. Right, because the, the purpose and intent of the course we're asking you to vote on would be to introduce AP biology and we would not run advanced biology anymore. So there's a very close piece and it's just been kind of an inching towards offering it. The downside of advanced biology is that it doesn't offer our students anything right now. It's not aligned with a, a college equivalency. It's not aligned to the AP. This would allow us to offer that alignment and post-secondary acknowledgement and the staff felt like they were ready to make that, that move. So. I mean, of course, I support something that's going to be of more value to more value to students. I guess I, I'd be interested if it doesn't sure. involve significant time. There's probably a document floating around somewhere about mm -hmm. what are some of the topics changed. I'd just be interested in yes. knowing a few a few changes without sure. spending a lot of time on it. Just email would be fine. Yes, I can get that for you. Sure, thanks, Christina. This isn't really more a question, but more of a comment. I, th I think it's exciting to hear the numbers of the kids who students who could take the AP exam, and considering how many more uh, students would be interested in doing that. But uh, thinking about equity, I just think we should be thinking ahead, too, about how this, the district could be supporting students who may not have the financial means to be able to. Those tests are expensive, right? I mean, I don't know what they run now. I remember they were expensive when I was in high school. So it's just a comment, rather, that that should be something that we should be considering is how we can support them. If more students are taking it, then that could be a financial barrier. We do that, don't we? That's we correct, do. yes, if, if you qualify so if for free. That. But I think making sure that students understand up front and mm -hmm. so that they, you know, we don't want them not signing up mm -hmm. for a course or not thinking I have AP potential. We have, in fact, um, engaged in something called the AP Diagnostic a few years ago to do kind of an equity audit mm -hmm. on um, access and enrollment in our AP courses um, and, and looked at best practices according to College Board that help you address matters of equity. Um, and um, um, Judy, who works with the secondary schools in her previous district, had gone a, undergone a substantial equity audit relative to advanced placement mm -hmm. um, access. So we're, we're excited to kind of compare notes to see if our strategies and strategies she's familiar with 
might help our, our, our schools also address exactly what I think you're asking about. Yeah, so. thank you. Thanks. Brenda. Just forgot what I was gonna ask. Oh, so this AP biology class will function the same as advanced, meaning they take regular biology first? Yes, yeah, there are, there are pre or co-requisites um, related to okay. science work. Yeah. <coughs> I, at one point, I don't know if it's still the case, you could take the AP physics class without taking regular physics. Right, there was a way to... Um, I mean, just because what right. was covered in the course. Yeah, instead yeah. of instead of going physical science, biology, chemistry, we have freshmen that start with biology, biology okay. chemistry, and then by taking physics. AP physics, it addresses those um, those more they, they address those advanced topics that would have been touched on partly in the freshman year. Thank you. And our last item, uh, full-time and part-time open enrollment policies and rules. So I'm asking Mr. Fries to stay since he um, implements and administers these policies. We are bringing forward changes to policy 423, rule 423, policy 424, rule 424, and policy and rule 425. Uh, it seems like we are routinely bringing these policies to your attention because of the numerous legislative changes to these policies. If you recall, we um, brought changes to you after the uh, most recent state budget was passed, which reenacted part-time open enrollment, which caused us to get rid of a number of uh, policies that Mr. Fries and his department work on. As a result of the legislative changes, the DPI has enacted emergency rules to implement those legislative changes, which has caused us again to have to revise these policies. Um, as, since we've had to revise the policies, we took the liberty to put the policies in our standard format, which is the definitions in the policy versus the rule, and including a purpose statement, and just aligning it with our standard format. The most notable change, is, and, and really it's not a change for, here's in Green, for here, us here in Green Bay because we are already doing this, um, but there is now legislation regarding students who um, open enroll out through the full-time open enrollment option and then request to take up to two classes in another district. So we had already um, accommodated our students who had um, most notably open enroll out to probably a virtual school and then asked to take two classes back here in the district. There was no mechanism to do that, but we had made arrangements with uh, the schools where they had open enrolled out to take two classes back here in Green Bay. Now the um, part-time open enrollment rules provide a structure for doing that and provide um, a fee transfer for doing that. Previously, we were entering into shared services agreements with these uh, school districts. We won't have to do that going forward because there is a fee transfer or fee mechanism for doing so. So we had to adjust the policies to do that. Questions? Okay. We'll move that forward. Thank you. And that concludes teaching and learning work session. Great. Thanks, Ed. Next we have organizational support work session. That will be facilitated by Andrew Ducker. Could you uh, recess for a little bit? Sure. Come back at 645. At what? At 645. Oh, I'm sorry. It's already. already. I'm looking at the clock in the back. It's five yeah, minutes late. behind. Come back in five minutes. How's that? Whatever clock sure. you're using. <laughs> Andrew is facilitating the organizational support work session. Okay, so we have under organizational support, the first item we have is the um, actuarial review. Um, <coughs> I'll just say something first before turning it over to Jean, because it was my initial request for the independent mm -hmm. actuarial review. Um, as Jean also mentioned in the memo, I had um, request an independent actuarial review because our consultant uh, didn't have an actuary on staff, and they now do. Uh, given that actuaries must report to um, industry standards, I, I don't believe the, I mean it would be 
highly unconventional for a different at for an actuarial second opinion to come up with anything much different as far as a overall plan design so it would be it would be my intent to um, make a, a motion in the next cycle um, authorizing a, a delay in the request for the independent actuarial review and I think when I come back with one I think what I would like an independent actuary to look at will be probably much much less than I thought was originally necessary it's just it's new information I do I do expect to have a few questions that I like to see an, an independent actuary look at uh, there's for example I know that there is a there is a wellness program and I'm not saying it's the right wellness program to do but there are there are employee wellness models where you are doing things to make your employees healthy and that's good and it probably reduces costs but there's also programs that actually have done the actual actuarial research and validated that uh, the buck 25 on our program returns you three dollars over over five years and maybe some of if some of that isn't isn't and I'm not saying we don't necessarily do a we don't necessarily throw things out because of the there is a there are benefits to doing things besides just the cost but I think there's I really want to look for ways where we can add offer something extra that actually saves more money in the long run whether that is wellness plans whether that's a test that isn't normally covered by insurance but could be we could be innovative and and offer um, I'm not going to pull an example out of the air because the last time I did that I pulled a really bad example out of the air but there are I know there are tests I, I suspect that there are tests that traditional insurance doesn't fund because their payback horizon is so many years out that perhaps we would look at differently and an actuary might look at that so that would be my my thought would be to um, and the reason it's the reason it's here is because the deadline was August and was extended to to October so as the um, as the requester I am okay with delaying it through the um, you know certainly making a motion authorizing it be delayed till the November 19th meeting since we'll have additional information and presentation in between that do you have anything to add? Um, I would just add that uh, on the second page of the memo we are looking at the impact of our health plan and to the services and one of those things is to just work really uh, in, a, in a purposeful way to uh, have places where employees can go for health care that are low cost but still meet the needs of their themselves and their families and so we're looking at uh, adding balanced near site clinics to the health plan and actually uh, removing a barrier which is the, the payment that they that the employee and their families have to pay when they go to our clinic and the uh, and the near site clinics and that might uh, encourage people even to a greater extent to uh, go to the clinics when they don't need to go to an ER or uh, make an appointment with their doctor and the positive thing about our um, our clinics is that they all have um, epic as a uh, as a system that the physicians and the nurse practitioners and nurses use so they can share the information with their primary care provider um, I'd also like to just share with you in, in November a couple of highlights from our uh, wellness report that we did from the health risk assessments that we, we've been doing, our personal health assessments. We now have four years, a four-year mm -hmm. cohort mm -hmm. of employees and their, uh, who have taken this, taken this over four years to show how they, they've managed their care in the metrics that are measured on that assessment, which I think is, is interesting. And, um, uh, we, we've scored very well as a district, and um, I think you'll find that interesting. So next week or next month, rather, we'll present some of the findings and some of the recommendations for adding some things to our plan that are wellness-focused. Okay, anything else? Okay, 
anything else? So, um, uh, not one hundred percent clear on what you were what you were saying. So you're delaying. So I would intend to make a, a motion delaying, um, postponing the request for October. an independent actuarial review until the November until the okay. November board meeting. At which point, I mean, I don't want to postpone it out farther and then maybe have to make a motion again but if I would have I would suppose probably if based on what I'm hearing here I think I would have a proposal for a much smaller scope actuarial review in November oh, okay so your your, your your motion will be to delay the deadline to request the Correct. actuary and then you'll decide you'll have another motion potentially of what you're right. going to ask for. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anything else? All right, then um, <coughs> moving along, we have the 100 <coughs> series school board operations and 441.1 um, student government policy. I have that uh, committee report and. Um, who would like to go first? Melissa? Okay. So if you recall, Dr. Warren had requested that the 100 series policies be reviewed. Um, a number of them are, are pretty dated and updated to reflect the current work of the board and the um, current um, collaboration between administration and the school board. So you have in front of you all of the 100 series as well as uh, what Andrew said, policy um, for, I'm sorry, is it 440? 441. 441, okay, 441 with respect to the student representative on the school board. Um, Dr. Warren, um, Ed, and Laura and I met um, for a, a good day. Um, Andrew, uh, unfortunately, wasn't able to join us on that committee, and so Laura stepped in in, in his place. And we went through all of the policies. We looked at model policies. We looked at other school district policies in comparison to um, our, our policies. And we drafted as a starting point for the board's discussion tonight um, language. Unlike other policies that we bring to your attention, like the ones that we brought earlier in the 400 series, these are truly your policies. These govern your work. These govern your interactions with staff and the administration. So um, it, this is for you to decide and for you to decide what the language would look like. So I put together a chart for you to hopefully summarize what the changes are at a very high level. We did not do comparison documents because some of these are brand new policies. Some of them were um, complete redos and it just became too confusing. Some of them are combining policies to hopefully consolidate so it's uh, more transparent and easier for you and the public to understand. Um, but you certainly are free to pull up the existing policy uh, on the website so that you can compare the documents together. So we can start and just go one by one. Is that how you prefer to do this? Okay. okay. All right. So the first is policy 110, which is the um, currently it's entitled District Mission and Beliefs. We changed it to District Mission and um, scaled back the belief statements because those are really fluid statements that the board. Um, changes from time to time. So we included what the district mission is and then as an exhibit we have adopted or we're proposing to adopt the district strategic direction which includes includes those vision and belief statements in that strategic direction as an exhibit. And that's what currently exists on the website. Any uh, questions on that? All right, so we'll move uh, one 110 forward, including the exhibit. Thank you. Um, then 130, uh, board legal status. The only revisions to uh, policy 130 is just to place it into our standard format with the purpose and then the implementation. There were no definitions in this policy. Okay, questions? All right, um, 133, school board vacancies. Okay. Uh, we updated the policy to provide further clarity on board, the board vacancy process. We did not make any changes to the rule as that was last re revised in June of uh, 2016. Okay. 
comments or questions? Rhonda? Are we all satisfied with the process of that, of how that works? Are you not? Well, I, I, I don't know. I felt like kind of a, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously very satisfied with Christina being here. That's not what I mean. Um, How long has it been that way? How long has that process been been in place? Well, the last, last the last time we did it before you mm -hmm. was Katie, it was so it's not a okay. So it's not like it happens too often. No. Yeah, I I, I, yeah, I think Rhonda, you and I had um, talked about um, is there maybe just just so there's no question about everyone getting a fair shake do we have a do we just suck it up and have a round one where everyone gets to everyone gets to show up and have 10 minutes before the board if they're a legal candidate in a, in a round one and before you go selecting more I mean yes that could be several hours but then everyone everyone got a chance to be heard right the the professional, the recently graduated student, every, everyone would get their chance. I thought that might be worth consideration. Well, nothing in this policy prohibits this, mm -hmm. it prohibits that. This is, I, I would caution you against putting such specific information in a policy because it's really, as the vacancies become, become open, um, it's for you to decide what that process looks like. So when Rhonda, when your vacancy became open, we, Sandy and I looked back in the materials to try and find the process that they used when Katie's position was filled. There was not much information. So the board put together that process for your um, interview and for your, for filling that seat. And then because it was so soon thereafter, that was the same process that was used when Christina was selected. So it's really open to the board at that time as to what you want that process to look at, look like in the language of the policy and rule would allow for that flexibility. So if we ever come back to it again, we can take a look or we can talk about it if we have to. Because this just re gives us the, how many days, you know, the timeline mm -hmm. has to be filled and all of those kinds of things. Right. <coughs> so is so it, it doesn't in hold rules us to that anything. we have the other stuff? No, nope. it was uh, what, remember if you recall when um, Julie was leaving, we brought to the board a proposed process. We had used guidance from WASB as to how to fill a vacancy, and we brought proposed questions and a proposed timeline and a notice and the advertisement that you all decided when yeah. we filled. I guess I just thought by now it would have been at least in a rule, if not in a. So there is no rule. We do have a rule, but it's not that specific because it allows for the board to design the process when the vacancy each, occurs. Each time. Correct. Okay. You know, some things might not have met your needs when you filled these last two positions, and you may want to go back and adjust the process. But we did that at a board meeting consistent with the policy and the rule. Do, does the rule have the emergency, whatever we decided was the emergency procedure to avoid, to preclude the possibility of it going 60 days and having the state pick for us? Did we do something with that? That's not allowed. We have to fill the position. Oh, no, I know that. But yep. <clears throat> there's... Haven't boards adopted um, alternative plan if you get to day 59 and you're deadlocked or something? Uh, the rule says if the <coughs> vacancy is not filled, um, then it does provide for how, how the vacancy is filled within that 60 days. So is there, I guess, is there a plan? I mean, is there, did we define some kind of a plan B if the board is deadlocked? The language of Rule 133E says um, on the second page, the board will implement the board adopted written procedures accompanying this policy that expressly address how vacancies are filled after the 60 day period. Um, so it's within the, the rule for 133 how to fill that after the 60 days. So after, after the 60 days, doesn't that happen for you from the outside? If you that, that law was changed. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> um, all right.
right. Um, other anything else on 133 board vacancies? Okay. Okay. Then um, move to 141 board officers. Okay. So we are um, suggesting that we adopt board policy 141. We currently have policies 141.1, 141.2 and we are asking to consolidate those policies into 141. 141.1 is school board officer elections and 141.2 is school board officer duties. And we're just consolidating that into one policy regarding school board officers. But there's no language change. It's just moving it up. There may be some, I mean there's no substantive language change. Okay, anything? Okay, we'll move that forward. One, um, 142 <coughs> District Legal Council. Um, 142 is a new policy regarding District Legal Council. There currently is not a policy that exists. This policy sets forth the roles and responsibilities of in house counsel as well as the board's right to obtain representation from outside counsel. Um, So I, just to make it clear, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine any circumstances under which we wouldn't <coughs> desire or want an in-house counsel in the district. And my only regret regarding in-house counsel is that we didn't move, that I didn't push for that idea much, much sooner than we did, given how much money was going out the door in uh, expensive hourly fees to firms that were <coughs> good but had didn't have Green Bay as their sole focus so uh, that being said I was just wondering if it um, if we're saying the district shall employ in-house legal counsel are we is that are we doing that like with with everything and again I, I cannot imagine ever not having a full-time in-house legal counsel for sure but I don't know I, I don't know if we have any other things that say we shall hire other than uh, superintendents and principals Ed? well um, I'm sensitive to the word shall I mean we, we had talked about that in relationship to uh, hiring where, where the word shall was was put in uh, erroneously um, suggesting that the board was going to delegate something that we have no authority to delegate. Uh, I would, uh, I'd recommend we change the shall to a may. Mm -hmm. um, if it's in policy, then you are saying that uh, future boards have no choice in the matter either without changing the policy. Okay, we'll make that change. Yeah, and again, I have no, I have no intent to, to change that we have legal counsel or who our legal counsel is, it's just the shall may thing. Agreed. Um, anything else? Okay. Move that forward. Um, <coughs> appointment of school board member representatives, 144. The existing policy 144 addressed the appointment of a legislative liaison, but it did not address the appointment of other representatives uh, of the Board of Education. So the policy was revised to include uh, rep appointment of other board representatives, the general roles and duties, and it also includes the role of the legislative liaison. Questions here? things that we've been been doing and just writing it down yep so. okay now okay. um, move forward to uh, 150 school board policy uh, school board powers and duties okay. so this the language of this policy was revised to recognize the distinct roles of the Board of Education which is governance and that of the administrative team which is management Policy 150 was updated to reflect the collaborative nature of the relationship while maintaining the separation of those roles. 
uh, questions about this one? And I might have a, a couple. I'm just looking at the old 161 here. I think one of the, um, maybe in some folks, myself included, find uh, more notable things is we, we took out the, uh, the, the team, the word team from, from that policy, if I remember right. I did talk about working in collaboration with, but uh, uh, not as a team. Um, Is so that the only change? I'm sorry? What were the other changes? Well, the old, if we're looking at just board powers, the old, the old 161 had. It's, it's 150, old, Andrew. 150. 150. Oh, yeah, but 150 is referencing, if we're looking at school board powers, the old policy. No, it's 150 to 150. So. Well, I guess I'm thinking more board. Is is 161 mapped to 161? Or is, it's cross-referenced, though, right? It's cross-referenced, and there's a there is a 161. Okay, so they're all side by side, but also cross-referenced to each other, or most of them. Um, yes, it would be. It is cross-referenced, correct? Okay. Well, I will. 160 is school board member authority. Okay, I just saw the I saw the cross-reference, and I thought some of that was coming into. Um, so, oh, never mind. I'm, oh, well. So, anyway, questions on 150. Now, there's, um, I guess, there's. There isn't a uh, like. These are all good practices that I think we mostly do, but there's not really, there's no enforcement mechanism here, right? I mean. Well, who would, what do you mean? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's, you know, there's, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, yes, you should work collaboratively and, you know, effective decision making, but <coughs> some people can run for the, run for the board for a variety of reasons. It would be within someone's, you know, right to, you know, to not not be here to be a team, but be here to um, replace a, a team or something, right? Uh, is there, that's, you know, that's not me. Um, add a little, uh, kick for a while where I was watching some really dysfunctional board meetings on YouTube and this is not this is not it it's never even been close but and I mean someone could be someone could be running on a platform of something other than teamwork and problem solving does anything uh, I mean you can't legislate being nice I guess is what I mean even though we're really pretty nice. So I guess I don't know, maybe I answer my own question. Does it use, there's a, well, it just says in the board shell. Um, that's if no one else is worried about it, I guess. I'm well, I, I think uh, and we, I don't think we have anything on there, although the question has been raised. Um, I don't think we have in here, correct me if I'm wrong, a, uh, a vehicle should I decide to really, you know, go off on a tangent and, and become, you know, just bizarre, is there a vehicle for the board to remove me? The board cannot remove right. another board member. The, um, you can censure, but that you cannot, re you do not have the authority to remove another board member. And that's statutory, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's you know, more about setting an expectation or a standard, right, rather than a... Well, I think we're the ones that, that set the, you know, are responsible for <clears throat> how our board functions. So, in terms of what was the word you used, Andrew? Uh, Enforce. Enforcement. Enforcement. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think that then the burden falls to us to enforce ourselves, either as a group. I or think it, the only recourse really would be, a, you know, that, that would be a, a public uh, determination to uh, attempt a recall. 
there's no vehicle right. within the board itself. So. Or something or something like a, a central, although my <coughs> state bar, which for me as a individually, my my bar to make or vote for a censor motion would be extraordinarily egregious conduct. So um, okay. So anything else on the one fifty? I'll jump ahead to, to one, 151, Adoption, Revision, Maintenance, and Dissemination of Board Policies and Rules. We are proposing to consolidate the existing policy 151.2 into policy 151. Uh, the language uh, deals with adoption and revision of maintenance, and then we're just adding also the dissemination of policy into the existing policy 151 for further clarity and to complete really the process of the adoption of the policy and then the dissemination of the policy. The language is the same, it's just all folded into one policy. Um, questions on that? Um, I have one under, um, so this would be 151, um, implementation, so that would be 2C, <coughs> adoption of new policies or revisions to existing <coughs> policies. Mm -hmm. So and it says in there, only those written statements so adopted and recorded shall be regarded as official board policy. So I've, there have been a lot of times where I've said something effective, yep, that's, that's a good idea. Nope, I'm not worried at all that anyone in this room won't implement it faithfully, but if, if we didn't write it down, we didn't do anything. So. I thought there had been some mention before that if things are uh, things are in the the minutes that that carries some weight. But really, should if we're directing some, something, sh should it be policy changes? Well, not everything you're going to do is going to be policy. Policy is designed to be the general guidance and in, in the workings of the school district and the school board. And then the implementation of that would be, as you pass motions tonight, we talked about um, the revisions to various different curriculum. We have a policy that provides the process for curriculum revisions. And then that would be the implementation as you make a motion to revise that curriculum. Are so you I, thinking of, of uh, the board giving instructions to administration that, yeah, that we want to see I, something I happen? So. And yeah. I mean, that's, that's so in, the, in the board minutes and that, but does does that that does not be written in policy? <coughs> but is For it that, to happen, right? Okay, does it require a motion though? I mean, I, I would think you, that's maybe that's a little bit beyond the scope of this, though. I can. So, right. I think it depends on exactly what we're talking about. We are bringing a policy forward, um, administrative action in the absence of the policy that's in this packet. So that may get to your concern, Andrew. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay, 151.2, administration in the absence of... Here it is. Here it is. Policy. <laughs> okay. So this, this policy is designed to provide that guidance when there is not a policy in place and to guide administration when they are conducting business uh, when to fill in the gaps. So this is <coughs> writing down what's probably happen many times. We have to conduct the day-to-day -day business of the district. Questions on this? Okay, move that forward. Um, 151.5, suspension of policies. The language was updated to indicate that policies can be su suspended provided the decision is consistent with law so that we couldn't, for example, suspend our policy on um, anti-discrimination or on bullying and harassment because we're required to have a policy with respect to anti-discrimination and bullying and harassment. Is that common that it's a simple majority vote to suspend policies? I suppose because you could, uh, someone could just make a motion and I mean to change a policy and that would be a simple majority mm -hmm. vote, so. Correct. Okay. 
And that's what's in the, the existing policy is the majority vote. I see where, you know, repealing policies because they're no longer <laughs> appropriate or we've rolled them into something. When might a policy be suspended? Uh, that That's just a kind of a curious. The Wednesday night, um, don't we have a policy that says we can't have school functions on Wednesday night? And then we've had times when we've had so many canceled games because of weather that they mm -hmm. can't fit them in and we can suspend that okay. policy to allow mm -hmm. that's the only one I could think of with that I thought there was another one that had come forward and I, I can't remember but yeah it's, it would be a temporary you know mm -hmm. like something out of the ordinary has happened we want the policy to continue but this particular year or month something funny happened and we have to suspend it I might have what? It might, it's oh, the problem. Oh, I only see that where the problem. Oh, sure. The yeah. I can't remember exactly. Oh, this is a little, little weird for me, probably. But it, the Wednesday isn't that awfully, <coughs> isn't that awfully specific for a board policy level thing? The Wednesday night activities. Is that still a policy? It is even a policy. After we've done all yeah. these things? And I've seen it in other school districts too. What is so the what, do we keep it? I mean, we did we keep it when we revised that particular section? You want to explain what the yeah. policy so is? We, oh, sorry. For yeah, I'm sorry. We have a policy um, that I I can't don't want to quote off the top of my head, but it, respecting a certain time on Wednesday nights to allow that's the night when usually if kids are in. Um, Formal uh, religious programs. Mm -hmm. That's the night that um, for those so formal all churches on Wednesdays are, are Wednesday nights. After six o'clock. After six o'clock. So it's. So it still stands after six o'clock on Wednesday. After six o'clock. Hmm. Yep. And it's that's very common across school districts. Five forty-five practice ends on Wednesday nights. And it's been like that. I'm not saying I'm opposed to the practice, but it's just it's very whether, specific. whether regardless of what you're doing at, at six o'clock, it's good to know that there's always going to be a short night of, of some, something. But that just seems really, like I said, for someone who doesn't get <coughs> too concerned about being specific in policy, that seems really specific in policy. But, okay. All right, well, so we, I think we looked at it. Um, within the last, I don't know, five years maybe, with the question of, you know, are, are these classes that we're having this policy for still occurring on Wednesdays? I know um, I haven't done it since oh, I've been so here. So maybe it's been so was before me. Then, yeah. But and at the time, they were. There was still a, it was. Well, I'm just strictly thinking but from Not a, universally. No, it's not universally. From a technical it's, it really perspective, isn't. and I'm certainly, I'm not, I'm not saying that I, I'm, uh, I'm not saying anything about having a policy to um, advance specific religious or advance or inhibit or anything like that, of course, but it just it seems like, you know, maybe a board directive as opposed to policy, but. When we, we can bring that forward in, when we do that section to look at that. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay, uh, 161, school board member authority. Okay, this policy was revised consistent with WASB model policy 161 and was updated to address various situations where a board member's authority may <coughs> extend, including authority to make statements on behalf of the board in the district, receiving, investigating, and resolving complaints, disclosure of legally protected or otherwise confidential or sensitive information, and interactions with district staff and district operations. To a large extent, the revised language already um, just puts into place what the board's practices are in these areas, as well as incorporates various provisions of other policies in the law that address these topics. Okay. Um, questions here? Um, I guess I have. I have a few. Um, see that my um, line that I use quite a bit 
made its made its way in here. Individual views, opinions, or positions by individual board members. Um, I mean, I, I was saying that before it was policy, and others others said it too in their own way. So that's good to see that in writing here. Um, and I think in uh, the the kind of funny there, but in seriousness to it, does it does clarify? We can you know if someone oh, wait a minute, hey, it's, it's right here. We speak as individuals. It also it also puts in writing very clearly that we do have the. Um, there's no question about the fact that we have our right to our to express our individual opinions as independent elected officials too. So that's in that's good. Um, wondering about the sh the shell thing in the receiving, investigating, and resolving complaints. Um, if an individual board member receives a complaint or other. Communication from a student parent, uh, you know, um, that appears to call for a response to the board member shall contact and refer the matter to superintendent of schools and learning or or designees, except for this highly unusual, which is a pretty uh, a pretty high bar there. And then, I guess, unless authorized by the board or performing his or her legally legal or board authorized duties as a board member, individual individual board members shall not unilaterally conduct an investigation into complaints um, or attempt three I'm okay with three B because it says outside of established procedures. Um, so I, I guess the way I I look at it in one you know one, one situation comes to mind where um, if I if I get a call about something that's likely to be touchy or sensitive, um, it's much more boring than some people might think. I usually have a talk about going to the proper channels, as I think, um, or have you tried the proper channels, or are you aware of the proper channels, normal channels. Um, there was a time that there was a time that someone felt that they wanted to speak to me in private first before moving that step forward and I did and in the off in the off chance that that causes me to have foreknowledge if something ever goes to a hearing that I have to recuse myself from which has happened never I I'm going to take that chance if someone says I'd like to I'd like to speak to you I I've, I've told people um, I really like to refer this to the the superintendent. Um, I'll go with you if if you'd like. Um, but I could I could see where there's if this is viewed very narrowly that any almost anything could be uh, a investigation. Someone could call it an investigation that's improper. And what if it says shall not? What is that mean or is the underlying theme here that these are all guidelines because really all the board could do is censure someone and only the electorate could remove someone so they're they're guidelines so the purpose of of the language in b1 and in the language of 3a is you are the ultimate decision-making authority and should you conduct an investigation it compromises your impartiality should the matter come to you through the formal grievance process or through the formal complaint process WASB is very clear um, as it is our liability carrier that we have to follow that complaint process and those grievance processes so not as to expose the district to liability and to ensure that for example um, let, let's say it's a sexual harassment complaint and the law is very clear uh, the steps that you need to follow when investigating a sexual harassment complaint to protect the complainee and though the individual that he or she is making the complaint about and if you don't follow that steps then um, there could be additional liability as well as additional concerns for the person who has brought forward the complaint so but this that, when the case that you're saying here that person would be breaking the law 
they'd, they'd be illegally, you're talking about someone, right? Not necessarily. No? It could be, um, it, it could be not enough that rises to sexual harassment or um, sexual discrimination, but it could be under our policies, um, prohibited conduct under uh, bullying, for example, and that's not necessarily a violation of the law because it might not be based on sex. But our policies are very clear the process you need to follow. So this language, it doesn't prohibit you from receiving a complaint. It prohibits the board from conducting the investigation about that complaint because, again, you are the ultimate decision maker and you would then be compromising your impartiality should that complaint come to your attention. Now, that doesn't stop you from probing a little bit and, make, and making sure that you are bringing forward a valid concern so that when you do come forward to the superintendent, you have enough information to share with him or her regarding the issue, but you should not be the investigator. That's what we have our Title IX staff, that's what we have our human resources staff, people who are professionally trained in conducting an investigation. See, see that's where it gets muddy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we, uh, where, where is it determined, uh, where is that line between getting clarification, listening to people, and then calling that an investigation. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not gonna bring up specifics here, but uh, you know, I, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Having been contacted and uh, invited in and following up and then being told, well, Ed, you know, you're, you're not supposed to be investigating. Well, I wasn't considering what I was doing investigating, so you know, just where is that line? I, I'm just not real comfortable with that. Uh, we could definitely um, explore that more and bring in and, and do some professional development for the board as to where that line is. I, I think that's a great topic to explore. This is really meant, this language is meant to protect you as the board. It's meant to protect the individuals who are bringing forward the concern, and it's meant to protect the process. So, you know, d digging in a little bit to, to see what's going on, that's not investigating, but when you're contacting witnesses and asking for various document, documentation, that starts to creep into conducting an investigation and what we would do on our end when we would conduct an investigation to ferret out whether the allegations that are being brought forward to your attention are, are accurate. Okay, and maybe it's a gray area that, that there is no, no clear resolution for, but. Uh... I would imagine this, depending who you're getting your professional development from, you might get different opinions about investigation. There, are, I'm, there's probably no clear. Are there any clear like legal? Is there? Is it like a legal term, investigation versus? Yeah, I don't think it's a legal term, but I would say when you're start. We have very specific procedures in place for conducting investigations and reviewing complaints. I'd say when you're starting to get into exactly what those procedures are, that's when in a, an investigation, and Jean could add. I think um, one of the things that I, I feel can happen and it varies with the individual is that as you ask questions of an individual or they share information, you start to form opinions and uh, sometimes you can be swayed by something somebody says and so when you, and you know, those of you who've done this work, and I know Ed, you certainly have, um, you start to, you try to be unbiased and you try to get facts. And when you're talking to one person, but perhaps not another person that may be associated with the investigation, but you may not even know it, you're starting to, um, your mind starts to go in one direction and your impartiality might be compromised. You may not even recognize that and that's what the danger is because when you, uh, function as a, as a board member, you're supposed to be impartial when, if any of these matters would come before you. And so you should not have preconceived ideas and notions about what you heard or what you may not have heard. So it's not always what you heard, it's what parts you didn't always hear. And it's that's when, so when we do the investigation, as Melissa said, we have procedures to make sure we've talked with everybody who may be involved. And Christina was next. I, yeah, I just want to go on record and say I would like to explore that more. It, I think the vagueness concerns me for the potential power to shut people down who are could potentially be trying to do good work to listen and understand something, and where somebody else may be trying to shut it down. And it could you could use this 
um, in that way. So I would like to learn more about it. I agree with you. I Um, anything else? That's what I was going to say. Okay. Okay. Um, I just I think we're on number 162 is next. He's still looking. Yeah, I'm just oh, you're still looking. I'm sorry. A little bit of stuff here. And hey, I actually have a question, Andrew, while you're looking. Yes. Um, uh, Brenda, maybe this is more for you, but um, going up to making statements um, as president on behalf of the board, it's like right. at the very top of, of 161? Yeah. 2A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2A. I'm just curious, when you are speaking on behalf of the board or speaking independently as a board member, do you note that when you're talking to your... Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I might not be perfect, yeah. but when I'm talking... I mean, when I'm talking in in uh, public, I'm speaking for the board. When I'm talking individually, mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about something that you know maybe the board has decided, or maybe you know then I'm speaking for the board because I can say what the board said. Mm -hmm. Other times, I don't know what the board's going to say, mm -hmm. and so they'll ask me what you think, and I'll say I can't speak for the board because we yeah. haven't had that conversation yet. But my own personal opinion is this, and I'll, I'll frame it like that. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, right. Um, so, board board member authority and interactions <coughs> with district staff and district operations. Um, are we? Does it become Does it become too easy for the? Does it become too easy for the majority to? shut down an individual's request. And I, I get that there's probably some point at which I could picture someone making you know, unreasonable requests versus requests that are not liked, I guess. And I, I don't know. Are you looking at 1C there? Yeah. Um, yeah, one. One C, yeah, one one D one C, D one C, yeah, D one C. Um, and I don't, yeah, the what's to stop? And and again, I we're writing policy here, so I'm not I'm not thinking too much about you know John trying to shut down my request. I'm speaking of a future in which different people might be around the, the table on both sides, people asking ridiculous, people asking ridiculous requests to, you know, some other board member in the future and also, or some, some administrator in the future who maybe didn't do something right and doesn't want it to be talked about very much, right? That both those things could happen someday and are we, is this just, uh, so someone requests something, the, Administrator says that would create, um, that would be an, um, this, hey, you know what, you know what, Mr. X, this would be substantial staff time, um, and then it goes to the board, and the board can vote down the, the request to do it. And it, it seems a little, I don't know the answer to it, but it seems a little easy. So just throwing that out there. Clarify what you mean. What seems well? Like so okay. So I'd like a, uh, I'd like a, I'd like a report on the types of types of structures built in woodworking classes district wide for the last two years, which actually probably isn't that big of a deal. But we'll just pick on something nice and innocent sounding. So. Then I bring it to the administration and this um, future administrator who might not be um, as on the ball as our administrators today, doesn't really want to talk about the fact that they're not really building a lot of wood stuff there anymore. So I, you know, Andrew, I'm just so sorry that is, uh, that is, uh, 
that requires, that is a record that does not presently exist and I would like this to be referred to the board as a whole. The board as a whole is not as nice of folks as we are right now and four to three votes me down and then the report just doesn't happen and the world never finds out that we aren't really making wood stuff anymore. Obviously this is not about wood stuff, it's an example. <laughs> We get that. I think I think one of the important things always is to to recognize that the through line of accountability starts with the board. So the questions that we would expect from the board would have to do with with the expectations around the priorities of the board work, um, and and if they are not, then the question becomes. And I think that that sometimes is the concern or questions that I get asked is, is this aligned to the work that we're expected to do from the charge of the board um, through accountability and those kinds of pieces. So um, I think that, that what is always helpful is if the question comes collectively so that the whole board can see what the question is and if, if possible. I mean, sometimes there are quick questions you call and ask an administrator, but for a work kind of opportunity, that's always helpful because then then it's a recognition that yes, this is the, the direction of the board. I mean, I think that um, what I hear and what I know is that we want to be responsive to the board. Our responsibility is to provide you what you need so that you can successfully govern in your roles and lead, um, you know, in a governance role. So, you know, that's, that's the balance that we try to address is making sure that the needs are met, um, and I'm thinking of, of potentially someone taking us way off into a project, and that's why we'd want to bring it back for the whole board and say, is this the desire of the board to, to do the woodworking? Right. You know? But I'm not worried, again, this is about policy. I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about anyone in this room. It's about, I guess it's a, I guess, Maybe ultimately there is nothing except the, ultimately I suppose a board member could go to court if they felt they were being denied something improperly. Well, you, all, you always have the right to do a public records request. Mm -hmm. The public records um, law does not require a records custodian to create a record. And I think this particular provision gets into where it's a substantial amount of work, and I think this is what Dr. Lingenfeld was trying to get to. It's a, if it's a substantial amount of work that redirects the work of staff in order to compile a request from a single board member, is that the will of the board to redirect staff work to compile information for one specific board member? I mean, I would, <clears throat> I get what you're what you're saying, but at the end of the day, I don't think we can control the behavior of future boards through what we do. I mean, this is leaving it up to the whatever the current board's preference is to, you know, decide whether they want the the report to be made. Um, and in the future, we might disagree with the, what the board the future boards do, but at the end of the day, they're they're the current board. Right, but it presents. You're still you're still creating a. You're still creating a certain bar. You're still telling the, you know, we're telling the, the future board who says you don't get to have any reports at all. You, you would at least, the, they would at least have to take the step, the public step of changing a policy. Well, I, I think it's it's not that you don't get to have any information at all. It's where it would create, it demand significant right. staff time to create, compile, or locate. That's what would be referred to the board. Because if you look at, um, Number one A, it allows for individual board members to make requests. It's only when it would demand significant staff time to create, compile, or locate. Yeah, the, the first sentence. So I think I think I think I found I'm concerned about, and I'll submit an amendment next next week. I think that it says you know the significant. It says if you're requesting a report that doesn't presently exist or that would require significant staff time. There's plenty of reports that don't exist that could that I've asked for and I've gotten that have should take it's flipping something in a pivot table, but again, could an administrator oh hey that nope that, that doesn't exist because I didn't I didn't have a field for the pivot table so it doesn't 
doesn't exist yet. Not you, future, others, maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll probably propose an amendment, but I don't want to word, wordsmith note here. Um, anything else on that? Okay, so we're on to uh, 162. There was just a slight change in 162 with a second sentence that says an initial orientation will be provided to new board members and then however board member orientation and development shall be considered an ongoing process for all board members. Okay, anything on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, school board memberships, 163.1. 163.1 was revised to encourage membership and participation in activities in other organizations versus um, the language was a little ambiguous in the existing uh, policy which said that shall maintain membership and that they deem to be in the best interest of the board and the board shall participate in their activities. So it's get, got to the word shall rather than, in, than encourage. Okay, we'll move that forward. Uh, board member compensation and expenses. The language was updated to include um, information regarding tax, Im tax implications for board um, compensation. Okay. Rhonda. Um, D, it says board compensation shall, shall be reviewed annually in April. Um, is that something the board reviews or is it staff reviews it? No, nope. um, Sandy puts it on the board agenda in April and the board reviews that. Did I miss that? We didn't do it, right? We didn't do it last year, but we do do it. Okay, I just want to. We often do it um, around the time of the budget, well, which is May when you're, I think so. you're submitting budgets. We have done it multiple times. We've never been able to bring ourselves to raising our salary. That's essentially what ends up happening. We have probably we've had this discussion at least three or four times over the last since I've and, been on the board. And that's not even why I'm asking. Um, I think it's there are people that don't know what we get paid. They don't know that we get paid. They don't know how that's figured or the, how people how they've arrived at that number. The discussion in general. So you're saying it should be more intentional when we do that. Yeah, and, and, to and I guess educate the public. On yeah, I guess because they really don't. A lot of people think we actually make like salary salaries. Um, so I'll kind of can I piggyback off yeah. that? So what I was actually thinking was is April seems like a weird month to me because of the elections. So well, if you it have be, it would be right after. Yeah, but I know. But if you have people moving in or moving out, it may not. I don't know, it just seems like an odd month to choose to review something like that. Well, when it's because, because the, the budget is due to the CFO in, in May, correct? Or June? It would coincide with budget. That's, what, that's why it's okay. okay. I get okay. what you're saying, okay. but yes. if we're going to make a change, then it Could it you move it up to, to March? Done. Well, then it's the old board making the decision. Oh, that's true. Board, yeah. 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 Okay, I get it, yeah. Just curious. It's never been in... I mean, the timing of it is always probably. It used to be January. Oh, did it? Oh. Do, do you feel like in this policy, maybe I'm missing it, that are you looking for language here that would show a commitment to transparency with, like, compensation will be reviewed and shared with public or what? How can, I, how can you connect your concern to the policy, I guess? I don't know if it's a concern. I just We're read here. that and I thought, did I miss a conversation that we didn't have, first <coughs> and foremost, because we didn't, obviously. Um, but I, I think there is, there are people that don't understand or don't realize that it's, we're not walking out with 40 grand for, as a salary for this position. Um, there are people out there that don't understand that. And I don't know how you would convey that, or? Well, you might, we, we could just add a little bit of language, our board compensation shall be reviewed, um, and uh, something about as an agenda item. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our meeting, yeah. I was thinking that too. 
I think no, I and I'm definitely. I think I remember other times we reviewed, but the review was simply, it's does anyone fine. wish to, to make what changes? No. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I, I think to have it more to have it be an agenda item. And for the record, I'm not asking for more money. That's not why I'm asking about this. So if we change the language of D to say board compensation shall be reviewed annually in April at a properly noticed meeting of the board. Okay. Andrew John had something. Uh, sorry, John. I can place it in the budget book uh, every October as part of those documents. That would be great. That's probably, that would take care of everything probably. Because then Isn't we could it, refer to someone to look at it. Is that in the budget book? I thought it was already listed. But you're saying put it as a specific. specific okay. Yeah. So okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So pie chart or something? Well, typically annual meetings are, are the location and time that board salaries are addressed. Mm -hmm. And ours is a little different format. Um, so we could publicize it in the fall in the budget book, which is on our website. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else there? All right. Uh, school board member behavior and ethical standards. This policy was just updated to put it in standard format. And these are these are our guidelines. There's no. Mm -hmm. um, we all we all do all of these things, but there's no, if, if someone didn't choose to review materials, there's no, you don't have to go sit in the corner or anything. <laughs> well, we could make that a Yeah, I, I don't know that you, I don't know that you could, probably. Mm -hmm. According yeah. to this, you could not, that's, that's not in there. Um, well, but I think, I, I think again that board members if there's, you know, if we're not going to do uh, whatever the word I'm looking for, punishment kind of things. But I do think that that it's that it's our job as board members to address things that we think don't follow the ethical behaviors in whatever way the board decides to do that. Okay. Um, One sixty-five point one uh, board member conflict of interest. This is a, a newly proposed rule uh, to provide transparency and clarity for the Board of Education and the public regarding what constitutes a conflict of interest for a member of the board and subsequent action a board member may take when a conflict exists. The policy also sets forth rights of individual board members of the Board of Education to seek an opinion regarding a potential conflict of interest. Please. You said it's a rule, but it doesn't say rule on our, did I say rule? Policy, it's policy. I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry. I just wanna make sure. Because it's long. We're on number 19. It's longer <laughs> than most policies, so I thought maybe it was a rule. <laughs> yes. It, yes. <clears throat> uh, questions here? Okay. Um, school board member. School board member electronic communications, 166. And this is an, another new policy requesting adoption. Um, the 100 series was last reviewed in 2005, so that probably predated the prevalence of electronic communications. This policy um, largely reflects um, state law regarding electronic communications among elected officials, and the use of various <laughs> methods of electronic communications imposes various issues for the board, including the areas of retention of records, open records, and open meetings. This sets forth best practices for school board members in the use of those electronic communications. So nothing that you haven't already heard from me with respect to the use of electronic communications. Three A, prohibited uses of electronic communications by board members. Um, Go to number two, communications for the purpose of campaigning for election. This, I, I think you mean district electronic resources because it doesn't say that. 
Right, we should make that clarification. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you'd be suggesting that a board member can't <laughs> use electronic communication for elections, which of course you do, you just don't use your district stuff for it, so. Yep, so we will clarify number two. So is there, um, so if there was a, is every, is, I mean, it's not something recent came to mind that doesn't apply anymore, but if something is merely procedural, if board members are weighing in by email on something procedural, I, in my individual opinion, I think that there sh should be open forum on this item, or in my opinion, as an elected official, we should do blank procedure, not substance. You still can't do that? That's conducting board business, because that is part of your function as a board to uh, govern the procedure of your meeting. But doesn't that come under um, acceptable use, number two, possible agenda items? Well, that's the suggestion of agenda items, but if you're talking about um, what Andrew had referred to, that's not simply an agenda item. So it's yeah. using email to change procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Can you clarify yeah. that, Brenda? Yeah. What do you mean, change it using? What, how is it a change in procedure? No, I was I was using Andrew's words. Ask him what he means. Yeah, oh, I was using, sorry. I was, using, I, was, I was looking this way. <laughs> An example where, if, uh, you know, out of out of convenience to everyone involved, wanting to say, hey, let's do, uh, let's make this an open topic, or hey, let's invite this participation, hoping that just everyone would realize that. But okay, you're saying that, and so other than an agenda item request, that's about it. It's really. If you are conducting the business of the board via email, you are in violation of the open meetings law. Well, I would even say, and if you know, suggesting an agenda item is one thing. Having five board members weigh in as to whether it should or should not be on the agenda then crosses the line. I think it's that's a concern because you have a policy as to how agenda items are placed on your board agenda, and when you start all weighing in, then that gets into the substance of how an agenda item is placed on placed on that agenda versus simply suggesting a topic and then taking that up at your board meeting as to whether that should be an agenda item. And just just uh, just in the interest of, of balance, I, I think I'm pretty I, I think I have a pretty good idea on this, but you would spend more time researching this than me. All of these fine tooth details that board members can't email even about mundane procedural motions that don't affect any substance at all um, absolutely the legislature the legislature has exempted itself from virtually everything that we're talking about right they have prescribed it for us and they've exempted themselves they can email they can caucus they can Go make deals, doors. Yep. Right. everything that we can't do, everything that they set out here, they exempt themselves from vir virtually. I'm going to pause short of everything, but it's a pretty accurate a high statement. Percentage. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, do as I do, do as I say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll make that change to 3A2, the use of district provided email. District provided email. Okay. Anything else? Okay, 170, regular and special meetings of the board. We are proposing to consolidate existing policies 171, 172, 173, and 174 into policy 170. That is a all-encompassing policy regarding this, the board's meetings that addresses regular board meetings, board work sessions, and special board meetings. There's a typo one six there. Number six? Roman six provisions. Where is it? Oh, spell check doesn't uh, catch all caps words. Thank you. Well, is that right? Mm -mm. I didn't know that. I never realized it. Mm -hmm. You, can, you can. can. you turn that on? You can turn that on. Oh, you can turn it on? All right. But sometimes I I'll research that. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. All right, so one, 170 policy questions. Uh, 170 rule. 170 rule um, governs the procedures for appointing school board members then to preside over those work session meetings. Do we, we have to, <coughs> do we have to do we update assignments yet or is that still in the works because we have had, I've been the, I've been the facilitator for a, a long time. Hmm? Said so you do such a good job. Oh, I don't. I mean, I don't mind it, but I don't I, like. I don't know who my. I, I could guess who my co-chair. Or well, my, it was Chris. Right. Yeah, and so when Christina came on, we just slipped her into Chris's okay. spot. Okay, I didn't know if we ever said that. Yeah. Okay. And I think. You probably called me and asked me or something, but I, I just well, don't I remember us ask, officially saying it. I usually ask at her at the April meeting. Because we have to decide who's. I you usually are, say, oh, maybe he wasn't here. Um, for a, a meeting with John and Jean. Okay. That, uh, but as far as the board decision, session. okay. Yeah, so that usually happens in April, and I always ask if there's board members of what would like to shift committee. Oh, I know that, but when someone came in, so, okay, I didn't know if this well, automatically Jean, Christina because she said it makes sense yeah. I just didn't know if we ever yeah. said it that's all yeah. oh, okay okay and then if you want me to switch to Christina every other month like we were doing whenever, it's up to Christina yep, whenever you oh Christina want. I can yeah. talk about it yeah, yeah just okay. let me know so I can change it thank you um, okay 170 then we're going to roll 171.2 agenda uh, preparation and dissemination. This policy was updated um, to reflect the uh, current format and to provide further clarity for the consideration considerations <coughs> the board president should make when determining when to place items on a board agenda. The revisions also address when a board member may disagree with the board president's decision not to place an item on the board's agenda. So the previous policy did not um, provide any process should a board, um, the board president not place something on the agenda. Well, didn't it, didn't it require the board member to place things on agendas? It said a board member may place items on agenda. Meaning yep. one board member has access to the agenda. Yep. So yes. this is a, this represents a substantial change. To this actual topic, when I rewrote the bylaws for the West Student Council, I actually eliminated a clause that basically said that because the concern was that th this, can al this can allow, you know, th that different factions can occur with any meetings. I'm not necessarily saying that's here, but I, what, what I'm trying to say is that you, it, can, it would be, it seems to me very easy to eliminate any topic that, uh, that it seems very easy to eliminate any topic from discussion on a board agenda. With, especially under 2B, s s seems most concerning to, to me. Mm -hmm. I was concerned about it enough at a student council level, which is not elected, which isn't an official elected mm -hmm. position that I eliminated that clause, so I don't, I don't understand why it's necessary here. Yeah, I, have the, I have the same concern if, you know, the, I remember way back when we discussed one board member, we, all, we also have in the policy above, we have two board members can call a special meeting even if the president doesn't want to, but yeah, I, I, you, know, you have here a situation where, again, not, um, not Brenda, not anyone here. I think we have respect here and generally, you know, we've had things like seconding for the purpose of discussion, even if you're not gonna vote for it, I, I'm not worried about it today, but setting a policy where, um, yeah, setting up, setting a policy where someone asks for a, someone asks for an agenda topic uh, and the board president doesn't 
like it and then the majority can just vote it down and it never goes on an agenda it seems like there's a the ability to just place something on an agenda is an important um, part of minority rights to go along with majority rule I'd be interested in what the, the committee discussion was about it Ed and Laura and Brenda want to discuss. I have a hard time recalling. I, I think the discussion. Yeah, I think the discussion was about um, the um, the the work of the district and items that may take a considerable amount of time, and um, a board member being obstructionist and putting a number of item agen items of for discussion on the board agenda that would um, be require staff to do a considerable amount of work and not I think it goes back to the, the previous discussion and then where that was within the district's priorities because in the board's priorities because the board sets the priorities for the year and then if items on are being placed on the agenda that are not aligned to the board's priorities that it has um, set forth for the superintendent and then the superintendent has set forth for the administration where that work would come in then with respect to agenda items. I think that developing that agenda um, and having um, some ultimate say over what's going to go on there for, for the next meeting is an appropriate function for the president. There is relief that's offered though uh, with the if if I decide that uh, if I wanted an item on there and it's refused, I still have relief by you know, looking at uh, item B, 2B, where um, being able to insist that at that next regular meeting an agenda setting topic be on there. So um, I may not get it on the October meeting, but you know I, I can insist that we discuss agenda setting in the November meeting. But does that mean it? Does that mean it goes on the agenda, just not at the meeting that you want, or does it mean that you have to plead your case to the board for it to even be allowed to be on an agenda? I think it's the latter. Yeah. So that means a major again, a majority of the board can shut down an unpopular, even even if three board members wanted it, the board could vote. If the board president didn't want that to be on the agenda, the, the majority of the board could say it will not even be on an agenda. Well, yeah. you know, if we're talking hypotheticals, and the other hypothetical was, you know, I decide that I want to clutter up the agenda just to be a, a you know, pain in the neck, so I'm going to put on, I want 15 things on there. I mean, that, you know, that's probably not very likely either, but. As long as we're talking hypotheticals, that is another hypothetical. Put out there, no. To address that point, I thought about that, but I mean, a de facto filibuster with agenda item requests, I think could be handled. I think if the if that was what was happening and someone was just trying to, you, you know, be obstructionist, mm -hmm. um, I think the board, just given parliamentary procedure, could very easily shut all of those down. It would take a little bit of time, but I don't think the I don't think there's too much of a worry. I don't I don't think a I think if a, I think if a board member wanted to filibuster, basically or be obstructionist, I think even I think that they could do it even if agenda item requests were limited like this. I think they could still do it with whether that's with debate or with excessive dilatory um, motions or something like that. I think there's a way for a board member who truly wants to be obstructionist to do that, even if they're not able to make agenda item requests. And I don't think that overrides the concern about a majority or about minor, um, minority not being able to put something on the agenda. I, 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 think there, I think there are better ways to filibuster if you want to. Christina? I, I think too, like under, for a four agenda appropriate, I'd like to see maybe just a general statement of commitment to, on the, on behalf of the president and superintendent. Just I mean, this is a policy. We're not going to get into the weeds here, but just saying like, 
will take into is committed to the consideration of all voices on the board and will to ensure that you know something I think general at least could call Where are you sticking underneath four a four two a four two a four sorry um, I think just like a general recognition of okay may not necessarily fit into your agenda I'm just using you Brenda as an example because you're the president right but recognition that there may be other people that might have something in you that there's a commitment there so I don't know I think that would make me feel better here good I mean, there is that. If the, whole, the rest of if four people on the board decide that they want that agenda item on, then it gets put on. Is that not, I mean, I get what you're saying, but I'm just clarifying. Um, and maybe it would help if you just. If, if we knew the words you were going to add. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm like That's spitballing okay. here. Yeah. I'd have to. Well, you can bring them, I mean, yeah. you can bring them back to okay. the next meeting. But um, anyway. Oh, Rhonda? Yeah, I guess, is there a lot of problem with this, that this is being created that we're not aware of? It just seems like a lot of control. I don't want to say there's a lot of problem, but this is a very typical policy in other school districts as to how sure. an agenda is created. Right. That's, but that, but that's actually not my question, is what other districts are doing. I'm, I'm focused on us, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking about what that looks like, and it looks like, you know, there may be board members that come and they're new to the board, and but yet they have ideas, ideas and they have energy, and, and but I mean, you're going to have to get four people to, you know, line up with you, and I don't know. This seems like a lot of, this isn't. This seems like a solution for a problem that's not really there. And what what I'd like to see is uh, language that recognizes. The, uh, the need to prioritize, but yet does not limit. I, I you know, personally believe that any individual board member should be able to have something on the agenda. But there is a practicality to it. And, and I don't know how we balance those things. I, I don't want to limit anybody you know, now in the future who is elected independently to, to bring something forward. I think your point as far as you know, and we've already heard that uh, in, in recent months here, ideas that, you know, a lot of us say, geez, why didn't I think of that, you know, coming up, that that happens. Um, at the same time, we don't want to be here till three in the morning, you know, with, with that, so, um, I mean, we need the wisdom of Solomon here to find that balance, but uh, there, there has to be that vehicle to prioritize but at the same time, I don't want to—I don't want to see any limitation on any individual board member's ability, uh, call it right, and say duty to bring forward an agenda item if they feel it's to the benefit of the school district. Okay. Go ahead. What? Do we have any guidelines right now? If I have an agenda item that I suggest to you, and you say okay, I'm going to take that into consideration. Do we have any guidelines for how that goes moving forward in terms of you then letting me know as a board member where that is going, either on the agenda or where the vision is, where that's going to go down the line? Nothing, well, right. in, writing. Nothing in writing. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, that's... No, it, you have to... The president must put it on, right? Or you, you, have, it, you have... You may place it on the agenda. I mean, I've, I've made agenda requests before where I've, you know, said, um, while I'm, you know, while I'm being polite and say request is the word that makes sense, just to clarify, I'm exercising my right in policy and I am placing this item on the agenda. Now, I think there have been times, I think there's discretion for when, I think there's, you know, as far as next week, I think there's some there's probably some cases or there's some parliamentary procedures that could be used to dispose of requesting the same 
the same or substantially the same item over and over again, I would think, you know, that could be, there's probably other ways of dealing with that. But right now, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're getting rid of one board member can put an item on the agenda as written and replacing it with if the president says no, you have to convince a majority of the board for it to even be heard. And that's, I'm not okay with that. I can share it from a, from a, a um, practical point of view with my own experiences, both in, in bringing something forward and then responding to. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been times, and, and I'll speak about bringing things forward or asking for an agenda item, when a response has been that, well, you know, what are you looking for? Just you know, help me understand. And then being given more information that really satisfied what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, I want to talk. I want to talk about the things that are you know, that the woods teachers are, are manufacturing. Okay. Well, you know, actually, we've got that information already. We you know we can put it on there as an agenda item. But does this satisfy your need? Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it has. Other times, um, where and I'm thinking of a specific item that was that was brought forward recently. Uh, we'd like to have an agenda item about such and such, knowing that such and such was on the docket for a board presentation two months hence. Mm -hmm. So uh, to have that discussion with the board president about, you know, what, it, what are you looking for there? It's not to limit anybody's ability to put it on, but, you know, there may be some other extenuating circumstances that can be clarified sure. through conversation. Um, sure, ultimately, uh, I, I do think that everyone should have that ability to put something on there. But, you know, what's your purpose of having it on there? Mm -hmm. Is it to gain information? Maybe that information is already there or it's scheduled for something else. Sure. And I, can I add something? Mm -hmm. I, I, I completely agree with you and I understand what you're saying, but it, it still seems a little bit not clear to me and I'm new here. So I'm starting at zero on exactly what I need to do and what the process is for getting an agenda item on mm -hmm. because I have suggested, I sort of like started to think like, I'd, what about this item? And I don't know what that means moving forward because I don't. I don't understand. I don't know what the process is. So, if that means that that's a conversation, that's a onboarding conversation. Um, perhaps that is. But I obviously I agree with you that all those things have to be taken into consideration. Just as a follow up to Des' comment, it actually states that a particular item of business on the agenda for a particular meeting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say it's not going to happen. It just says that it's not going to happen at that particular meeting. And I think to your point that, you know, if something is already scheduled for two months out, then it makes more sense to cover it there. Or if you've got the information that you need, it doesn't have to appear at all. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's meant to dissuade somebody from putting something on the agenda. I think it's when it appears on the agenda, sure. not that it um. does. Although it says you need a... <coughs> A majority. I mean, it is stating that you need. Basically, people have to go in and vote to actually sometimes. Move it just it says that that member can then push it for the next and have them commit to a particular meeting. It doesn't say. Yeah, but it's, it does say the board can decide right. when, if at all, mm -hmm. the issue in question will be calendared or. If at maybe all. if we got rid of if get, at all. Get lose if at all, and then you've got the. Which one are you, where are you? B, B so the last B. sentence. 2B? 2B, so 2B. the board as a whole. Yeah, yeah, that's still very possibly not happening. When the issue in question will be. Oh, get rid of it at all, yeah. yeah. Right. Although I don't know if, see, number two would still allow the board to, the board as a whole to. So having heard your concerns that you don't want the board president to be the veto, essentially, of a board member's ability to place something on the agenda, let me go back and revise 171.2, because it still does include important considerations as to timing and that sort of thing that right. the board president already is taking into account when sure. right. board members I don't, are I don't think the individual board member gets to have it whenever they want, okay. and if it were, if yeah. it, but it does, but it does include the with that if at all, it then does include the board as a whole can right. just not even hear it. So I will revise this. Is this specific to just open session? Does this also include closed session items? This would include all, all board meetings, yep. Okay. 
But a closed session can only be held on specific items. Well, yeah. under the law. I, I, well, I can't put anything I want on a closed session. It has, no. to, it has to fall oh, within wow. right. a fairly narrow scope. Right? I would veto that. <laughs> Is that in uh, here? No. <laughs> um, so, in thinking through this, I guess I'm, I'm thinking back to the, um, again, that we don't want our board meetings lasting until 3 in the morning. We also want to make sure that what we're asking um, our administration to spend their time doing in preparation for board meetings is going to further, you know, the goal and strategic direction of the board. So when I look at this, I would, if I had, a rec then I'm just talking about, this is a hypothetical that, um, how I would handle this. If I had a request for something that, that, um, that didn't feel like I mean, it, it violated what I just said. It, you know, was was um, um, not not worth the enormous amount of time that it's going to take to prepare for an agenda item. Then I personally would bring that to the board because I wouldn't want to make that decision. But I don't know if that's um, you know that's just what I would do to say, okay, here's a request. Here's the time it's going to take. Does the whole board want our administration spending this time on that? Um, but I don't think that's that's in here, because um, um, for me I wouldn't want to make that decision by myself. I mean I, I do that a lot where I'm you know asked to make a decision I'm not comfortable without the board's the board's input as a whole. Um, so this policy doesn't prevent me from doing that, Correct. but we don't need specific language to allow that to happen because that's what's already in here. Is well, what you described there, you haven't vetoed. Uh, it don't going on the agenda. I mean, right. If the agenda is there, and then it's up to the board to decide right. whether or not this is something that you know, but advances it, what the the purpose of the of the district. Right. But what I would do is violating what what ever uh, with, with what we're trying to take away, and is what I'm saying. So right now we're saying we don't want it to come to a board vote about an agenda item that anybody should have the right to do that. Um, and I'm just saying, you know, as, as a matter of practice, I would want the board to, I wouldn't want to make the decision. Want that I, I wouldn't want to put that on the agenda without the rest of the board knowing the enormous amount of work that this is going to take and is it worth it to us to have that on the agenda? Well, there would, I could see there being times, I could see there being times where I would honor, I would want a fellow board member's request for an agenda item no matter how wacky to be honored. However, I might, I might choose during the course of that agenda. I mean, that doesn't mean that the, you know, if it's clearly a motion that's not likely to enjoy board support, the administration yeah. doesn't have to prepare it for hours. They could say, you could say, yep, Andrew, your your agenda item. What are you even talking about? And then the board could have more of a chance to weigh in. If that, well, my agenda item is I wanna I wanna report about the precise amounts of the the wood and the the birdhouse project and everything. Then the board could say no, no, we're not. You're not spending that kind of time on it. But Andrew, anything else you want to say about it? It's your because yeah. it's your. I don't think it's. A, I don't think it's. I mean. Yes, administration prepares well for agenda items, but I don't know that they, they don't have to have a full report to every agenda, especially an initial hearing of something, right? That's, yeah. Which is what we just did with something at our last meeting. I can't I, remember what it was. We just had a conversation without anybody preparing anything. That's, that's what we've been doing actually in my report, is adding topics of discussion, general discussion without that's a lot right. of work. Um, I think that the caution in that, though, is sometimes there's there you would t your takeaway at the end. I think that um, as as we move forward, I think there needs to be probably deeper discussion as to next steps because there are wonderful wonderful things out there to talk about that improve education. A lot of research supported different initiatives and things. I think that that's the piece, and you know, as as people are out there, and everyone has their their understanding of great initiatives, that the opportunity to bring forward great ideas all the time, 
um, it, it really goes back to capacity around administration to deliver all of the things because I you know I, I've yet to have a discussion on any items here that weren't worth our time you know to bring forward it's just a question of where the priority it goes back to where the priorities are so maybe that's a, a, a further follow-up in a later you know when you d dive deeper into whatever the topic is but that's what we've been doing is bringing them forward in that report without a lot of preparation giving people an opportunity to at least open the discussion can i add to that michelle well. i think for me um I, having that transparency of this is this over the next six months these are our priorities this is what we're doing here's kind of an outline of what our i don't that would at least allow for me, when I'm thinking about agenda items, to look forward and say, when would be, when do I feel like it would be an appropriate time to bring mm -hmm. this up? And then having a dialogue rather than sort of right. feeling like I'm shooting in the dark. Right. And, and typically, um, when we do the teaching and learning reports mm -hmm. and they talk about what's next mm -hmm. and what's coming, um, there should be a document, just to, and okay. I don't even know if you have it yet, um, that others had that John had laid out the month by month reports. Did he share that with you? I thought he did. Um, but if not, to your okay. point, really, really yeah. important. Okay. Absolutely. We had that conversation. Yeah, at our yeah. monitoring reports committee. But if, yeah, I mean, if there's the things that are already that existing that I can, re I mean, it doesn't yeah. pay anything new, no, but I that would just, I, yeah. It makes that's really good, good sense, and that's, and that's why it's important, though, for. for so so I'll take this back, and I'll, I'll make the revisions consistent with the discussion. Okay. okay. So that would be two. Preserve that an individual can put an agenda item on, but not necessarily exactly when. Correct, and that if in a, and if an individual puts an agenda item on, with, that would create considerable work for staff. There is no expectation that staff would be required to prepare. Um, yeah, that's not a, a report. Right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry, not to beat the agenda discussion with, you know, not to get into it. Can I ask one other question about this? Yeah. So we have our agendas. They're beautiful. I know you all spend a lot of time on them. They're very detail-oriented. I appreciate all the hard work that goes into it and the time. Is, is there any legal reason why we can't simplify them for our public that are coming in? Because I find them to be very heavy there's a lot of jargon there's a lot of text and if you're coming in as a lay person and you're trying to follow along it can be challenging so I just didn't know if there was a legal reason why we couldn't explore that um, and I don't want to get into the weeds I'm just curious yeah. my we've own actually question. gotten the opposite request of being told we're not being transparent um, but yes we have to the public meetings law require you to put enough detail in your agenda so that the public can reasonably rely on that information to know what you're going to be discussing at your meetings. Uh, the jargon that I think you're referring to is the jargon for the closed session mm -hmm. and the, that language is what is required mm -hmm. under the law. I understand that. I mean, I think our, the average person reads at a fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. If we want to engage our public in dialogue to come to the meetings, this, this is, I'm just, this is my concern to come in we why is nobody coming why people are intimidated by these documents and I think that it is an I think there's opportunity to still be transparent and to still be clear about what the what the board is covering but just to take that into consideration and realize that these documents are very um, intimidating to people if you don't have a legal mind and you don't have an idea of where it's going so that was my own. So I, I suggest if you have if you do have suggestions to talk Sandy prepares the agenda every week and you're talking about the agenda or are you talking about, talking the about documents this? that go with the agenda? I'm talking about yes, those. Okay. Yes. So if you have suggestions okay. we're But there's no legal reasons why they have to be exactly the same for what we're seeing and like what pe people are coming in and following. They do need to be yeah, the same. Be the same. Just, oh. But there could be there could be there could be an additional there could be a summary. I mean, there, in, a, in addition. Not I don't want to put more work on you, Sandy. I'm just thinking about, again, people being able to come in and follow what we're doing. I, we'd be happy to have the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. 181, Rules of Order. Um, 
updated to reflect the board's current practice of not strictly adhering to Robert's rules of order so as to allow for informality in conducting its meetings, which is provided for in Robert's rules for small boards. So we, we do not strictly follow Robert's rules, um, but we do follow uh, them to, to the best of our ability, and this policy recognizes that any misapplication of or failure to precisely follow Robert's rules uh, standing alone is should not be construed to render any decision made by the board to be void, void, voidable, or otherwise invalid. No. All right, here comes the parliamentary law junkie. So this is going to sound really dumb, but I just for my sanity, is there a way to take out the f that you mentioned the tenth edition? Can you take that out of things because it's not the current edition? And Robert's Rules itself allows it, allows it to be cited in bylaws or policies as Robert's Rules of Order without having to have the edition number on there so that every time I see 10th edition, I don't just go on one of my parliamentary rants. Well, that would be for the board, Noah, because that's already in the existing policy, so that it question is. would be directed okay. to the board. Okay. But it actually says in, it actually, it actually says in the 11th edition that earlier editions aren't it's probably cleaner to just say Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, right? Or current edition? Current edition. It's for you guys to decide. Current edition? Okay. No, it's still newly revised. Do we have to even have an edition in there? You oh. can just say Robert's, because Robert's Rules itself says you can just cite it as Robert's Rules, Robert's Rules with yeah. the understanding that that means it's the current edition. So I would just suggest we strike newly revised 10th edition. Okay. Okay, thank you, move that forward. Uh, 183 voting method. Did we skip quorum? Did I skip quorum? I didn't see. 182 is missing. Okay, no um, revisions are being suggested to 182. I will make sure that we add that back to the packet for. Um, that defines that's quorum. a quorum. Policy? That it, it yeah. just defines quorum. That no suggested changes are being added. That's that's defined for us by the state, right? Correct. Okay. All right, um, but we'll put that back in. I'll put me. that in there. All I'm right. sorry. Uh, 183 voting. Um, voting method. Uh, policy 183 was updated to provide further clarity regarding acceptable methods of voting at Board of Education meetings. see something weird happening, but it's covered. It's covered by the fact that a single member can demand a roll call vote, so. And that's the law. It is. Mm -hmm. Yep. On anything. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you Run give an example of that? Just. Yeah, so like um, someone, are, are secret ballot votes illegal except in a couple of very rare? Sort of, okay, correct. so they're illegal. I guess I was thinking mostly of that, but a, a state law would cover an attempt to try to do that anyways. So. Motions were um, all, when we go to adjourn, we don't do a roll call. Sandy says all those in favor, mm -hmm. and then it's a voice vote of A or nay. So but you could, for an example about who would call a roll call vote, ask for a roll call vote? Like anyone could just do it, so. Yeah, so it's not really when a, would a that problem. Happen? Yeah, you I, I guess, I guess someone makes a, them. yeah, someone, there's a voice, um, you take a quick, a quick voice vote to make no changes to the, the woodworking requirement, and someone wants to put everyone on the record, so they say I call a roll call vote, just so it's clear. Yep. Okay, all right. But the only time we don't do roll call currently it's pretty is rare currently, anyways. We just assume and approving minutes. Um, I'm assuming the two times we don't. <coughs> Um, all right, anything else? 184. Uh, 184 was revised to provide further clarity regarding the purpose of the minutes of a Board of Education meeting as well as the public's right to access those minutes. 
questions? Well, um, implementation, uh, Roman 2B, uh, to written copy shall be sent to each. Uh, does that assume that electronic is written? Other questions on this? Okay, move that forward. Uh, 187, public participation at school board meetings. Uh, this policy was just updated um, to reflect the formatting updates. Now we have a, we have a motion related to this that was postponed to December so that if enacted may amend policy 187 is that that would be correct, correct? and that's yep. that's um, uh, scheduled for December yes so, so this Pat we can we can pass this and it doesn't change that something is has been set on the December meeting okay. Brenna? but this isn't that prescriptive this policy it is not. I would suggest if you want to be as descriptive as our discussion was at uh, our previous meeting, we do a, a rule that would yeah. really be the implementation of the policy. Because this pretty much just lets us decide how we want to do open forum, which... Correct. Um, again, you know, we can decide how we want to do it as our current board, but I don't know that we should decide in perpetuity how, well, of course, they can change the policy anyway, but... Um, I mean, this gives us flexibility, this current policy. So I just wasn't sure if there was anything in that motion that might be contrary to the policy. I don't think, I so. Don't think so. No? Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, participating via technology. Yeah, so the last time... Uh, the 100 series was revised. I'm guessing this was not an issue, but we have had board members needing to participate via technology. WSB strongly recommends to have a policy in place prior to any participation via technology. So this policy um, really puts into place what we've already been doing here in the district with respect to board members who have participated via technology. This policy has been re um, suggested to be revised with respect to the role and responsibility of the student representative to the school board. The proposed revisions were reviewed by um, board representatives, the executive director of secondary, the coordinator of our district co-curricular programming, and the ICSC advisor. Um, so right now we have the, the ICSC representatives. We have a very clear very clear procedure that we've had for base, basically forever. I think 1981 was when the ICSC started. Um, at first, they only participated in regular board meetings and then the committee meetings, which are now the work sessions, were added. Um, They can, student reps participate in the open sessions. They can't participate in the closed sessions. We never, that was never written down and it should be, and it is now. Um, I, have a, I have a suggested amendment that I'll pass around here and explain. My, my concern is that, um, um, my concern is in primarily in two implementation, 2C. Um, 
a, a new a new situation is created here in student representatives roles and responsibilities that open some doors to take things in an open meeting in open session and allow the the board to cut off student participation in them we've, we've never done it before it's never been a problem before and I just don't I can't think of any time where I would be okay with with that um, what I what I changed here was um, simply they shall be eligible to participate in discussion during open session and there will be no participation or attendance by student representatives in closed and executive sessions um, I also in C um, took out um, they can put items on their agenda under intracity student council report subject to the discretion of the president and superintendent I would suggest we take that out but leave in accordance with board policy and rule um, and I also took out in the areas of direct student concern I don't know what that means I don't know what what we do isn't direct student concern I mean I guess Noah's comment about Robert's rules and having the wrong addition is since it's internal board matter is probably pretty far from direct student concern but we would have all missed it if he didn't catch it so I just I, I'm thinking maybe this was model language or something but I just don't want to open new doors to cut off <coughs> input especially where it said um, certain other areas not or the board the board shall decide the extent of student participation in its deliberations and then yeah I just, I just don't I just don't think the board should be able to shut down the student reps if it's not appropriate for the student reps then it I would argue it's not appropriate for the public and if it's appropriate maybe for closed session at that point I agree. Yeah. Other than that, I am I am glad it was clarified because the old the old policy said there will be board student reps. The rules says a lot more, but the, the policy did not did not say enough, and something something needed to be there. I would just prefer that it would say this. There's also again not that not that Michelle would do this, but this could be interpreted as. The um, so there was something in A that suggests that the superintendent could feel like dramatically overhauling how ICSC works and just by themselves. As, That's as currently in the policy. I don't. Um, That's okay, the language right. of the current policy. That that was taken directly from the current policy. Okay, I don't think that's a good idea either. I mean, as, as specified in board policy and rules, we have a detailed rules and I, I just think this is covers it better other other districts might have stuff that's more limiting to students but we have a very good tradition of broad broader student input at meetings. Ed? Um, I'm fine with everything C on down I just have a question with, with implementation B then uh, the new language, the, the language you're uh, proposing, is specified in board policy and rules. Is that saying that we have to develop more uh, new policy and rules specific to the organization? I, I don't think so because there are rules. There is a rule. The okay. rule 441.1 .1 is their bylaws, so that would specify. Oh, it's already in policy. Yep, it it's already in is. Oh, okay. So, so then we're referring the rule. Yep. Okay. So if the if the theoretically if, if the council wanted to do something way different they could propose a, a change which the board could decide to adopt into rule or not adopt into rule so. again I don't speak for the whole council 
but I think that these changes should probably be shared to the council just in case they have any questions, like not these changes, but like this proposed policy and the changes that come with it should probably be sh pr presented to the whole council just in case there are any questions about it because it affects that, because it affects that council so directly. Of course, I don't speak for the council, but I, th I think that that would be a good thing. And uh, I would talk about it this month, but this month our agenda is full and it looks like it'll be that way next month too. So I, so I think that what, that when, did it, when are these changes going to be approved? October. Likely October 15th unless any are postponed. Okay. So we could, we could provide, I mean it's the, the board's prerogative to, to change it, but I would assume if ICSC had a concern about it, they could put it on the ICSC report and then it would, we could talk about it then. Well, right, but my concern is about the council seeing it, which wouldn't happen and because the October agenda has two presentations on it, which take up more than half the time. And the agenda item requests have been denied for October and pushed to November. So this can't actually make it on before the board approves it. I, I, can I offer something? Yeah. I, I think the, the I, I understand your concern. No, the the policy really is about what the the board um, deciding what the role of the ICSC representative is. Your bylaws are what the student council decide with respect to how you function as an ICSC. So the, the policy is, is the board and the role of the representative with respect to the, the board and then your bylaws are your internal functioning of your ICSC. And that's the Board of Education Policy and Rule? The existing 411.1 rule right, is. But, but when I'm looking at C, to be on, I'm looking at Andrew's document because it's easier. Um, at the end of that, it says in accordance with Board of Education Policy and Rule. Correct. And it, it's, it's it's different up top. So I'm just, but we're talking about the same thing. For four four one point one rule. Right, but I mean in in two B, it says specified, and this is your words, Andrew. I think you're referring to the same thing, but they should match. Oh, rules and right. rules. Well, it says Board of Education Policy and Rule. And yours says board policy and rules. Okay, that's, yeah. So they just, you're talking about the yep, same I'm thing, I'm talking right? about the same okay. thing, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so then I do have a question about um, uh, the uh, C to B, the agenda items. Um, and I'm wondering if we can see the, are the bylaws attached to here at all? You they're online. Them. I I didn't attach them, but they are online. Oh, they're underneath the... We can go online and look at them? Yep, they're, okay. they're an actual board rule. Okay, because I'm just wondering um, what, admit, well, actually, you can probably tell me, what, is, what, is, what, is the, what do the bylaws say about putting um, agendas on their intercity student council report? Is there said, yep, there's language. Uh, through the president, the council may place items for discussion within the school board agenda under the agenda section reserved for the intra-city student council report. That's all it says? Mm -hmm. Through the president? Through the president. Okay. And again, we're not bringing forward, as you right. know, as a committee, when we met, we were not bringing forward changes to the rule because that's their, sure. it's yeah. their document. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, to your point of this being a board, this, these changes being a board thing, yes they are and I'm not implying that the council can veto it because it is a board, the board can do this with or without council approval. I'm not saying this is subject to council approval, it's not. It's a board, it's a purely board thing. However, I think it would be, I think it would be preferable for it to at least get its way out to council members and I see now that that, prob that can't happen at a physical ICSC meeting this month. But I think an email would be nice just to see are there any concerns you guys have about it or something of that nature and if I tried to do that I'd be accused of. Uh, well, of it's, well may, you may or may not but I, I guess I think you're, it's a fair point that the board, um, I, it's a fair point I think that if we're doing something that affects 
ICSC, even if we do this version, which really is just clarifying what happens now, does it, is it, is this an emergency? Not really, could, you know, maybe this one we do in, maybe just this one we do in November. That way, just in case the council has questions or someone wants to speak in open forum, they can. Michelle? Just a quick question. Now, um, no, if Jamie were here, could the two of you discuss that and couldn't Jamie send something out? As the pre you know, the yeah. president? I, and I actually do plan on talking with her about yeah. just sending this stuff out, yes. And but so it, it I, is kind of short. I mean, it's it's the oh, timing the is the, the timing the turnaround timing is quite short, and the you know agendas are are full. So if this maybe if this isn't, I guess I I would like to do this. Um, I would like to do it this way, but I don't think there's any emergency created by waiting for just this one till no till the November meeting to finalize it. When you say the agendas are full, what agenda are you talking about? Our agenda, not your agenda. Our, your Sunday evening agenda? Yep, our Sunday. Okay, we're meeting with you guys on the 11th. I know. So Could this just be presented to? On the 11th as an informational yeah. item? On the 11th. It's the yeah. quarterly meeting with the ICSC. Yeah. Oh, Can't in the this, morning. Right. And then you can, yeah. and then right. it, Can't this it, just be so just an informational item? In our schedule? And then if that gives you the 15th, if you want to speak, to it either oh, yeah. through open so okay. 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 Yeah. That, I don't claim to then we don't have yeah, to you got the tenth edition, I get this one, so good. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't right. I don't so we claim can to do it with no discussion so that it doesn't take the place of what else is already on the agenda. Because you said good catch. I wouldn't want us to have a thirty minute discussion and then you know the I wouldn't want us to have a thirty minute discussion about something that was plopped on their agenda at the last minute. Right. But I mean if you could you and Jamie can prepare I think yep. the, the intent would be it's an introduction, and then the 15th right. would be the opportunity. Right. Probably, although we've. Yeah. I'm not because really you would interested. actually be giving the ICSC report before we. Prior to our, our vote on this, so. Yeah, so. yeah all right. I will. I'll, I'll talk with Jamie about that. Of course, I do, I represent myself. But it is, it's a board meeting. Uh, you know, it's a board meeting too, and this is when the board thinks it makes the most sense to show it to ICSC. Right. So we'll just do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good board. Thank you. So my um, to-do list is there was the change in the legal counsel policy, and then the revisions to 171.2, and I will include in the next. We'll, we'll have to include in the next. Um, meeting the policy on 182 quorum. And then there were a few other minor changes, but really it was 171.2 that needed the larger changes. Okay, thank you. And then, okay. anything, um, anything else on that? All right, and then um, closed, closed session, that is still scheduled, correct? Did you read that? Yep. Just, Last yes. two times I didn't have to read it. So, <laughs> all right. I move that the board convene into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 1985-1C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, and pursuant to Wisconsin Statute. <laughs> 1985-1F, considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, except where paragraph B applies, which if discussed in public would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. To wit, personnel matters, the meeting will begin in open session to consider the appropriate motion for a closed session so provided by law. The board may return to open session to vote on items discussed in closed session. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. Aye. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again.
If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448-2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible.